Liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope on a window on the universe. Conclusion we've come to is that there's a significant spherical aberration appears to be present in the optics. A very aggressive set of measure of uh, movements were made. It should have significantly improved the image, but it did not. But it did not. Can we do unique and important science? The answer is an emphatic yes. And nobody's walking away. All right, you gotta go for relief. For a decade, NASA's Hubble Space Telescope has been orbiting above Earth, capturing life, helping humans see and study distant realms. It's as though we all have gone on a 10-year voyage of discovery, far away and nearly to the beginning of time. In 1994, after the telescope's optics were corrected, the Hubble witnessed a unique event in human history. Carolyn Shoemaker made the discovery using a ground-based telescope at Mount Palomar with team members, husband Jean and colleague David Levy. I don't know why I've got it. It looks like a squashed comet. In July of 1992, a comet passed so close to this giant planet that it was split apart into approximately 20 fragments. And so began a global adventure to track comet Shoemaker-Levy like a runaway freight train barreling into Jupiter. Scientists hoped to have a good view to learn about the nature of comets and the atmosphere of Jupiter. But this comet went way beyond expectations. It's happening tonight. We have a fully repaired and healthy Hubble Space Telescope which has been performing like a jewel in the last few months. <laughs> we were fortunate to have the Hubble in the right place at the right time to be able to capture this one. That large ring, that big smudge, you could easily fit the Earth inside that diameter. This is one big impact site. Observers watched for impacts using telescopes all around the globe but they could see the best details using the Hubble. In hundreds of images, the Hubble has given the world both discoveries and a universe of beautiful pictures. Some of the most popular Hubble images are stunning new views of known objects. Hubble's eyes provide greater understanding of objects that have long tantalized astronomers. What Hubble lets you do is to see the details of those objects, to see them at the level that you can understand the physical processes that are giving them their shape and their character. Whether with the visible light that we can see or the light from the spectrum that we can detect, Hubble gives astronomers better eyes. With those eyes was confirmed a theory that seemed like science fiction, a supermassive black hole in a spiraling disk at a galaxy center. Nature has wonderful surprises, and this disk is far more interesting and revealing than we expected or imagined. Much to our amazement, the disk shows spiral structure. We were very excited about finding the disk because it provides a new and simple way to make a decisive test for the presence of the black hole in the center of M87. These are the most definitive measurements that show how that disk, in fact, is spinning. We're basically looking to see how fast is something moving toward us or away from us. The speed that we actually measure is coming toward us at a million miles an hour. One coming toward us, that speed, one coming away. So this thing is really rotating. If this thing is just gas, you know, what's holding it together? Why doesn't it just fly apart? And the answer is very straightforward. It requires a very strong gravitational field to hold all this together. There truly are billions and billions of stars that have collapsed inside and been eaten by this black hole. 
In the next years, there were more large galaxies with more supermassive black holes to see. With the use of a new faster spectrograph, STIS, Hubble became a black hole hunter. The Hubble Space Telescope was put in orbit above Earth's atmosphere to penetrate the mysteries of the universe. Hoping to see the earliest form of galaxies, the Hubble Deep Field Team took the deepest look ever of the sky. The team pointed the telescope at one tiny spot in the sky for a 10-day long exposure, accumulated data, then added three filters together into one full-color image. as far down that image as we can, and we still see galaxies. And if we count the number of galaxies looking back in time, we still see that number increasing. And so that sets a very exciting constraint that says that galaxies turned on uh, when the universe must have been very, very young. One of the great legacies of the Hubble telescope will be these, these deep images of the sky showing galaxies to the faintest possible limits with the greatest possible clarity from here out to the very edges of the universe. Using Hubble, astronomers saw galaxies at the edge of the universe. To measure the expansion rate and estimate the age of the universe, astronomers observed Cepheid stars and used other distance indicators. It's a pleasure today to announce our final results from the Hubble Space Telescope key project to measure the expansion rate of the universe. We have used the Hubble to measure distances to spiral galaxies using a particular kind of star known as a Cepheid. The brightness of a Cepheid is directly related to how fast the brightness changes. It provides a very accurate measure of the distance to the galaxy. Our final result is a value of 70 this value of 70 yields an age of 12 billion years. It's come to a culmination now. You know, how do you feel right now? I think with the Hubble Space Telescope, we have achieved what we set out to do, which was to measure a Hubble constant. So I have to say, it uh, feels great. By measuring the Hubble constant, you measure how far away the galaxies are. You can answer the question, how long the universe has been expanding. And by looking at very distant objects, uh, you can even ask the question whether the expansion that we see near us has been speeding up or slowing down over time. And that helps you answer the profound question whether the universe will expand forever. So there are a lot of things at stake here. It's not just a number. The results discussed today, I see them as the first acts in a grand cosmological drama that's going to play out over the next two decades.
USC, Columbia. In the work stands at Palmdale. The uh, modifications out there included about 133 modifications and upgrades. This is uh, on the flight deck where we see the old analog cockpit uh, dials and gauges have been removed in exchange for the new glass cockpit. This is uh, on the aft. Backing away now from Palmdale, taxiing out to the runway for the departure for the flight to Florida. And this is uh, video en route. And now Columbia is at Kennedy Space Center, landing gear being lowered. The 747 in the background. This uh, was uh, in March. 2001 as it returned to KSC. It's now in this uh, image in OPF Bay 3, and uh, there was a window inspection going on there that we saw. And uh, now some of the astronauts here doing the uh, crew equipment interface test are checking out some of the tools that uh, will be in the payload bay that will be used by the astronauts during their spacewalks. Astronauts there actually in the payload bay looking at the restraints and the uh, areas that the tools are stowed. This is the final engine going into Columbia. This is uh, engine number three. We can see the uh, plumbing inside the orbiter in the main engine compartment. And the engine is being put into position in preparation for closeouts. This now is the uh, pushback out of the hangar out of OPF Bay 3, the uh, rollover which occurred earlier this year on January the 16th. And uh, Columbia was rolled the brief quarter mile over to the vehicle assembly building in preparation for mating to the external tank and solid rocket boosters. OPF Bay 3, where Columbia spent uh, almost a year. <laughs> Columbia now entering the transfer aisle on the north end of the vehicle assembly building. That's the lifting sling that will be attached. Columbia's on the orbiter transporter and this is rollout going out to the launch pad on January the 28th crawler there moving along the 3.2 miles out to pad 39A at about 8 tenths of a mile an hour Columbia now Approaching the ramp and the computerized leveling system on the crawler transporter will keep Columbia level as it goes up the incline. And the total time from the uh, big time rollout began until it arrived at pad 39A and was hard down was just over six hours. And there's the uh, orbiter access arm that will be uh, rotated in position once Columbia's firmly hard down on the launcher pedestals.
Uh, they were originally designed to go between 50 to 100 miles, which was the estimated time for the Apollo program only. And uh, we have managed to keep the keep them running up to date to where we're over 1,700 miles. Uh, I consider them a national asset, and we have, we'll feel real privileged to be maintaining them for the nation. Uh, the problem of rolling out of the VAB uh, was a steering problem, which kind of snuck up on us. No, we did not expect it. Uh, if we had, we'd have corrected it long before now. But it kind of caught us off guard. Uh, we rebounded, uh, it took two days to get it fixed up and get it rebounded back. And we got it going out the crawl away like new. It's a labor of love because uh, not only is it a job, it's also something you take pride in. When there's only two on earth, and you have both of them that you ha have to maintain, uh, there's a lot of pride to keep it up and going. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our press briefing for TCDT with the STS-109 astronauts. We'll begin with some remarks by our mission commander, Scott Altman, and any of the other crew who uh, may wish to say something, and then we'll go to questions and answers from the media. So, Scott? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of the time to give you all a chance uh, to ask us questions, but I do want to just say uh, how excited we all are to actually be down here. It's been a long time for Columbia, a lot of work by all the folks here at the Cape, and we see it paying off with the condition that the vehicle's in right now. Uh, seeing it out on the pad when we flew down here the other day uh, was a real thrill for all of us to look out there and see Columbia uh, on the pad uh, poised for lunch, so we're really thrilled to be here. It's uh, also kind of interesting to be in here in this room since you usually don't get to come in here until after you've done something, so uh, we're kind of getting ahead here uh, and it feels good, so I'm looking forward to talking to everybody. What I'd like to do is just have each member of the crew introduce themselves, give you a quick uh, background summary, and tell you just a minute or so about what they're doing on this flight. Peter? I'm Dwayne Carey. I'm the pilot on the mission. Uh, my primary tasks will be to assist uh, Commander Altman with uh, many of the piloting tasks. I'm also responsible for several of the subsystems on the orbiter, and I'll be orchestrating the uh, photo and TV documentation activities during the flight. Nancy Curry, I'm the uh, flight engineer and primary arm operator on the flight. Uh, this will be my fourth flight. My last flight was SCS-88, the first station assembly mission. I had the pleasure of flying with Jim Newman. Um, on this flight, I'll be the flight engineer for asset and entry as well as for the rendezvous phase. About 400 feet out on the rendezvous phase, I'll then transition to the back and uh, take over the responsibilities of operating the arm. Uh, of course, we're going to use the arm to grapple Hubble, to release Hubble, and then we're going to use it every single day during all the EVAs. So the only time we're not using the arm on this flight is the day we launch and the day we land. And uh, so it's a absolutely wonderful flight for an arm operator, and it's a great team uh, to be working with the Hubble team on this mission. I'm John Grunsfeld. I'm the uh, MS-1 and also the payload commander for this flight. It's kind of an unusual flight uh, as a payload commander because our payload is already in orbit, and so I'm uh, responsible for the uh, execution of the spacewalks once Nancy and Scooter and uh, Dwayne uh, have gotten Hubble and put it in the payload bay, we'll uh, be ready to go out and do five spacewalks. Uh, this mission is a very ambitious mission. It's uh, going to be challenging, and when we're done, Hubble will be uh, significantly better than it's ever been, and we'll have new capabilities that I think will boggle the imagination of astronomers and people all over planet Earth. Uh, I'm teamed up with Rick Linehan for EVAs 1, 3, and 5, and Jim Newman and Mike Massimino have paired up for EVAs uh, 2 and 4. We have a contingency EVA, an extra six day available if it's required. And as I think all of you know, uh, we have a number of big ticket items. We're putting a new power system on, which includes solar arrays, uh, power control unit, and uh, new diode boxes. Uh, we also have uh, the power control unit as part of that power system, which is one full EVA day. We're putting a new camera in, and we're going to bring the near infrared camera back to life. So our, our plate is quite full. And with that, I'd like to uh, pass it on to the rest of the EVA folks for the flight. 
Hi, my name is uh, Rick Linehan and I'm MS3. Uh, I'll be assisting the flight crew uh, on the flight deck for entry and uh, as John said, uh, we'll be together for EVAs uh, 1, 3, and 5. Hello, Jim Newman. This is my uh, fourth flight also. <coughs> Last flight was with Nancy on SCS-88. We did uh, assembly on the International Space Station. The, uh, the skills that we honed there, Nancy and I are bringing to this flight. I'll be paired up with Mike Massimino. We'll be going out on the second and fourth spacewalks. We'll be putting on a, uh, replacing one of the solar arrays, doing the reaction wheel assembly change out. And on the uh, fourth day, we'll be doing the advanced camera for surveys. On the flight, I'll also be working on the desktop computers, the ones that uh, make it more like an office and allows us to, to uh, feel more at home and uh, get a little more out of the, out of the system. Mike? Hi, I'm Mike uh, Massimino. This is my first flight. And as Jim said, uh, I'm partnered with uh, Jim for EVAs 2 and 4. And I'll also be uh, the backup arm operator working with Nancy on the uh, uh, deploy and uh, retrieve of the telescope. All right, we're ready to take questions now. Please give your name and affiliation when the microphone comes to you. We'll start here in the front with Marsha. Um, Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. I suppose for John um, and any of the other EVA um, men. This, this flight has been described by um, program people as being the most spacewalk intensive. And pr could you s describe how that is besides the sheer number of spacewalks and perhaps compare it to your last Hubble mission, whether this seems to be a tougher uh, job you're going to tackle from an EVA point of view? Thanks. That's a good question, Marsha. On the last flight, uh, STS-103, of course, because of the uh, Y2K issues and some of the orbiter issues, we were shortened to three EVAs. Uh, original plan was to do four EVAs of about six hours each. We ended up doing three EVAs of eight hours each. And so the HST program got most of what they wanted done anyway. Uh, but we learned some important lessons from that, uh, not the least of which is that at the end of eight hours, the EVA performance is starting to, to peter out. It's just a hard environment to work in. The suits are very tough to, to live and work in. So on this mission, uh, we have a, a challenging array of tasks but the overriding theme that we're working towards is to try and make sure that the EVA duration is a reasonable duration. And the target that we're shooting for is six and a half hours. Uh, on a couple of those days, we're going to exceed that probably by about a half an hour. So the, the challenge for this flight with the solar arrays, the RWA task, the advanced camera for surveys, the PCU, and the cooling system is to fit all of that into five EVAs. And so we've spent a, a lot of time, uh, hundreds of hours at the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory working out a very tight choreography. And I think the choreography that we have of tasks between the EVA crew member who's riding with Nancy on the arm and being manipulated around the payload bay and the free floater who is you know, free to roam around the payload bay, those, the choreography of those two crew members trying to keep them working full time uh, is, was the real challenge for this to fit everything on the plate. And so we've spent a lot of time training to make sure that we can get all these tasks done. And uh, we're going to try and keep them in you know, six and a half, seven hours. Uh, Hubble has, uh, it's a 12-year-old spacecraft in orbit. It was designed to be serviced, but there's always surprises. And so we've also added uh, kind of a 20% factor to account for normal differences between ground and space and little surprises. Uh, so we've gotten very good at, in the neutral buoyancy laboratory of making our times, and our challenge is going to be to try and keep those times on orbit. It's a, uh, the difference between a sprint and a marathon, and this is more like a marathon. Um, and a question for the commander, uh, Commander Altman. I'm wondering, do you get the sense that the security surrounding you in, the, in your launch um, is equal to the last mission, which of course was the first mission after the attacks? And do you think it's necessary to keep up this level of heightened security for your flight as it was for the last, since everything went fine on the last mission? Well, I know everyone uh, worked very diligently to ensure that uh, everything ran smoothly for the previous mission. And what I can say is so far, uh, everything that's gone on here has been almost transparent to the crew. Uh, all the folks in security are, are doing their job at their level and keeping it at an appropriate uh, response and that we're down here basically with our heads down trying to keep focused on tasks and doing our part of the job. 
Welcome, Steve Seislaw from Florida today. Um, my first question is for uh, John Grunsfeld. I'd like you to describe for us, if you could, the um, sensation of working on such sensitive equipment while you're wearing a bulky spacesuit. Uh, let me let me answer that, and then also pass it on to Jim for his perspective, if I could. Uh, on the last mission, we were very focused on getting the task done. And when you're floating in the neutral buoyancy lab in Houston in a spacesuit, you have the luxury of thinking about that you're in the spacesuit and trying to learn uh, how to compensate for the pressure, how to compensate uh, for the fact that you are in this bulky suit, that you can't, if you want to hold on to a tool or let go of it momentarily, you can't put it in your teeth anymore and hold it while you do something and then take it back out, uh, you know, and tether protocols and all that kind of thing. My own perspective is that I thought a lot about that before going into orbit and working on Hubble last mission. But while I was in orbit, I never really thought about it very much. And there was one task in particular that involved some very small connectors. Uh, if any of you remember, it was the uh, SSAT box, the transceiver. And when I was done with it, all of a sudden I sort of looked around and said, oh, yeah, I'm in space doing this. And it was you know, kind of like the light bulb going on. I was so focused I'd even forgotten I was wearing the spacesuit. It was just you know, focused on the task. That being said, there are some times where, especially as a free floater, uh, transporting yourself along the side of the orbiter, or when you're making a large translation on the arm, that you can't uh, but help look at the orbiter or planet Earth and think, wow, this is just incredible, and realize that you're in this clock spacesuit, and on the other side of that relatively thin barrier of 11 or so layers is, is a vacuum. OK, uh, let's go back over here to Bill Harwood in the back. <laughs> or with CBS for, for John or any of the EVA guys. Um, can you give us your strategy on, I know your six EVA is a contingency, obviously, um, but given the PCU really stretches over three EVAs to get it all done, and uh, some of the NICMOS stuff, I was just wondering if your strategy, if you got down through five and it just started NICMOS or hadn't gotten to it, would you, uh, would, can, we, can we look forward to a six to do NICMOS, or is NICMOS a low enough priority that you wouldn't do a six EVA just for NICMOS? Let me let Jim have an opportunity to speak. Well, that has been captured in the flight rules, and I think that uh, succinctly it is that we won't start um, NICMOS unless there's a reasonable chance of finishing it. But unless, uh, it, if it takes a little longer, for example, in the morning they're doing NTC, in the afternoon they're doing the radiators. So if it takes a little longer than expected, and they don't get the radiators on that day, then we'll go out on the sixth day and is that to, to finish that part of it up. So it hasn't been, uh, so it looks like there's no chance of getting it done at all, then they won't start it. But that would mean a lot of other stuff didn't go well earlier in the flight. Uh, and there's a number of permutations to that. And if you haven't had a chance to talk to Brian Austin yet, and I'm sure you will soon, then you'll get all the, the details which are captured in the flight rules there. If you have any more, uh, John might be able to add to that. I mean, I know what the mission priorities are from an official standpoint, but from a from an EVA complexity standpoint, would you rank the things you guys are doing as, I guess PCU is first because it wasn't built for it, but, or is it? What, what, what's the most complex in down the line? Well, that, that's a good question. And, you know, from, now let me answer that from a personal viewpoint, you know, strictly a personal viewpoint. I think the advanced camera is the most important part to the telescope. That's the part that's going to get us the really G with science. The, the reality is that we can put the advanced camera for surveys in, but unless we fix the reaction wheel assembly and the PCU, there's a finite chance that we won't get to do any science at all because if they fail completely, uh, we'll lose the science. So the, uh, from the science community, certainly ACS is the top priority. From the observatory perspective, uh, we really need to do everything. The, uh, the solar rays, the PCU, the RWA, and then ACS is the uh, icing that brings in the really amazing science. Yeah. From, uh, from EVA complexity, I think the PCU is definitely the most complex and carries the most unknowns. Uh, we've trained it over and over again in as much detail as we can. Certainly, do, we do it in the NBL. We have a very high fidelity mock-up in Houston uh, that all of us have been using. It's kind of an interesting task because for most of it, you can only get your left eye on the work site. And uh, so you lose parallax. We practice in, in gloves of course, and with, with the new tools, we're very confident it will work. Of course, the experience on STS-82 with a, a similar box 
it's the closest analog we have to the PCU, is that it's just going to be darn tough. So complex might not be the, the right word if, if you're looking for challenging or most unknowns or most uncertainty, because in truth, connectors aren't all that complex. You can plug them, plug them back in. Um, it's the uncertainty of doing the task which wasn't designed for it. John helped design the tool that he's going to be using, that he and Rick are going to be using. Rick's taking them all off, most of them off, and, and John's putting them back on. So from a complexity, it's not all that complex, I'd say, but it has the most unknown. Uh, as Mark Lee pointed out, don't be too surprised, as when he did DIU, that uh, it's a little bit harder to put back on than you expect it. And that's where the uncertainty and the extra factor, the extra margin that uh, John mentioned, I wouldn't be surprised to see this at a seven or seven and a half hour EVA. In the end, how we use our resources on orbit will actually be more important than the time, I think, and that is like on PCU day, we're resting John while Rick is working, then we're going to rest Rick while John is working in case we need to do another swap. Resource management. Peter? Peter King with CBS News Radio. This question is for Mike. Mike, I kind of look at your uh, position as uh, being similar to, say, the rookie who gets to start the Super Bowl in this first NFL game. You get to go up there. You get to go EVA on your first time out. And on top of that, you get to work on a very vital and expensive piece of equipment, the Hubble t Telescope. Just wondering how you feel about that. Are you nervous? Are you excited? Both? Uh, yeah, just about all of that. I, I'm, I'm pretty excited. I feel very fortunate, actually, in uh, Speaking of these guys, when we first got assigned, I felt like I was the uh, luckiest uh, first time space flyer since Alan Bean. Alan Bean got to walk on the moon on his first flight and get to spacewalk on Hubble. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited. I just feel really fortunate to get an opportunity to do this. Um, as far as uh, you know, how I generally feel about us uh, performing the mission, uh, the, the thing that makes me feel confident is uh, that I'm paired up with, with this crew here. Uh, Jim and I together, I think, are a good team. And uh, with John and Rick inside watching us, along with Scooter and Digger and Nancy on the arm, uh, I feel pretty good about that team. And along with all the folks on the ground that have trained us and will be looking over our shoulder, it's a, it's a pretty good team. It's a team effort. So I feel pretty good from uh, looking at it from that standpoint. Follow-up for you, is there any one lesson that the veterans have taught you about going EVA? Yeah, they've taught me uh, lots of them. And the, the, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is go slow. Let's go really slow. Um, if you think you're going slow, you're still not going slow enough. Take your time, have patience, and uh, you know, take it, take it easy, take it step by step. Mike, Mike Cabbage with the Orlando Sentinel for John. Uh, could you talk in very general terms about Hubble's contributions to astronomy and why it's important to service and upgrade it? Hubble, uh, as as many of you know, has far exceeded our expectations for a, uh, an orbiting observatory. Um, Lyman Spitzer was one of the uh, originators of the idea of a spaceborne telescope, and it was a very simple idea. Uh, Ground-based telescopes looking through the atmosphere get blurry images. Uh, the second part of the idea is that the atmosphere absorbs a lot of light that the universe produces that, that we can't see from any uh, mountain or terrestrial observatory. And so the idea of putting a, an orbiting observatory, the Hubble telescope uh, in orbit, had been percolating for a long time. When we got it there, we knew that we'd be able to see many galaxies, we'd be able to see deeper into the universe, we knew we'd be able to do observation of planets in our solar system. Uh, what we didn't know is that we would be discovering that two-thirds of the material in the universe is made up of stuff that we have no clue what it is, and that there's some fundamental force associated with that that's causing the universe expansion to accelerate, uh, and we don't know what that is either. And that's a recent discovery. Uh, we also didn't know that we'd actually be able to do weather predicting on Mars from some of the high resolution uh, observations, nor did we ever imagine that we might be looking at the atmosphere of a, a planet around a nearby star. Not just that there were planets around nearby stars, but that we'd actually be able to determine what some of the constituents of the, that atmosphere are. And, uh, you know, someday, you know, we might even be looking at uh, doing real high-resolution spectroscopy with Hubble. The question always comes up, well, we now have eight-meter telescopes on planet Earth, very large telescopes with mirrors that can continuously distort themselves to account for the atmospheric distortion. Even with the best technology right now, Hubble is still the premier telescope uh, for doing very fine detailed observations and also very, very faint objects. Plus, we have the fundamental issue on planet Earth that with the Earth's rotation, you can't observe all night long on one object. Uh, eventually, the sun comes up, 
that gets light and you have to stop observing. Hubble is very good at staring at one spot for long periods of time and looking at, uh, very deep into the universe. And so Hubble's contributions really fall into those areas that uh, an Earth-born telescope just can't do yet and never will be able to uh, in cosmology from down to planetary astronomy. Jerry? Uh, Jerry has from the Time Magazine. Uh, what is the uh, Actorite watch? How does it function? What do you do with it? Can you talk to it? Is it a wind-up? What kind of a watch is it? What's its function, please? Well, I guess that's uh, a question for me. I'm the uh, crew member who's participating in an experiment. Uh, the Actolite watch is actually designed to measure physical activity and uh, light exposure as part of a sleep study experiment. So I'll wear that every day in flight. It'll uh, tell them on the ground when they download the data uh, what my light exposure was and how active I was while I was uh, up there. So you have to wear a watch even while I, I sleep every night, which could be a problem because on the previous flight, I accidentally took a watch off while I was sleeping and it floated away uh, until I found it about two hours later of frantic searching. So uh, I promised the experimenters I would try and keep the watch on this time. Todd? Uh, Todd Halverson of space.com for um, whoever wants to answer, maybe John. Um, I am just curious about whether any of you lose sleep over the fact that uh, the Hubble Space Telescope has to be powered down for the first time in orbit and the finite chance that it might not power back up and, and what, if anything, you could do in, in that case. Should we all say yes to that? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's, a yes. it's certainly a concern. Yeah. When, uh, when the Goddard Space Flight Center first proposed that we should swap out the, the PCU and power control unit, uh, and we did realize that we were going to be taking all of the power off internal to the telescope, but also all the shuttle provided power all the way down to disconnecting the batteries. Uh, that was my first question. Is, you know, here's a telescope that's been up there for 12 years and it has thousands of mechanical relays, you know, just little reeds of metal that click back and forth. And once we have all the power off and uh, do the repair and turn it back on, you know, what's the sequence and what's the confidence that everything's going to turn back on? And that was, of course, a common concern of the engineers as well. Um, my question was a little more specific. If uh, in a particular box, a solar array drive electronics or something like that, those relays don't go, can we go and tap it with a wrench to try and unstick the relays? And I was quite serious. Everybody else thought I was joking. And that offer is still out there. We can still go out and do that if, if so desired. But Goddard did an extensive analysis of every single box on Hubble, looking at over the last 12 years, uh, have any of the boxes not been turned off and on at least once to check out all these relays? And it turns out one box has not. And so they took the ground-based version and looked at it in great detail. They're even confident that that one will uh, turn back on after it's been turned off. It's a multiple access transmitter for Kedris, and they have two of them at any rate. So uh, it's easier to worry about things that we have no control over. And so that's my, my number one worry. Pat? Pat Duggins, WMFE for Jim and Nancy. Compared to STS-88, is this an easier mission or tougher or no comparison? Um, in some respects, it's very similar. It's a very challenging flight. Um, the free flyer capture aspects of it, uh, you know, every free flyer capture that we do is exciting. You know, you're essentially uh, flying formation on this thing at Mach 25 and trying to dampen out our relative rates before going in for grapple. Uh, unlike the FGB that came in at a very orthogonal axis, with 90 degrees to the arm, uh, Hubble, of course, comes in at about a 50 degree angle, so there's fairly significant arm maneuvers that we uh, do to go grapple Hubble. There's also a, a whole host of contingencies uh, should there be antennas deployed or should we have any arm failures. So from that perspective, it's similar. Um, Definitely flying the arm uh, for that many days in a row and throughout five EBAs, all of which they could easily go, say, six and a half, seven hours, um, will be challenging. Um, the commander scooter is going to be backing me up on the arm, and I'm really going to be looking forward for uh, some relief uh, on flight days uh, or EBAs four and five, and uh, so we've trained to hand off those tasks. But uh, in terms of the choreography between the EBA and the RMS, uh, I'd say it's very similar to what we did on uh, SCS-88. Uh, Jim and I, having flown together before, 
um, you'll probably hear very little communication between the two of us because I sort of know where he wants to go and uh, and where he needs to be and so we've kind of worked it out that he can kind of point and I know where he wants to go and uh, so you may not hear a lot of communication particularly when Jim's on the end of the arm. Okay, I'm being told we have to cut this off after one more. Dan? Uh, Dan Bill out of West TV. A question on uh, space tourism for, uh, I'll address it to you, Scott. Uh, uh, he's not involved with you guys, but Mark Shuttleworth is at JSC training right now, and there seems to be a whole new approach and, and, and an openness uh, about allowing this and that space tourism and space tourists uh, is going to be a, a kind of an accepted thing, at least for the rich. Now, what do you think of that approach? Well, uh, we did hear that uh, Mr. Shuttleworth was in town, although we've, uh, as I kind of referenced earlier, have had our heads down training. Our uh, training schedule has been pretty full. I haven't had the luxury of considering uh, some of those issues too much. But it does seem that NASA maybe has a new attitude, and uh, I think we'll fly this flight, uh, come back, and figure out where we all stand after that. All right. That's all the time we have, so we thank you very much. Well, STS-109 is uh, our fourth servicing mission to the Hubble Space Telescope. I think everyone would agree that uh, the Hubble Space Telescope has been one of this country's most valuable scientific assets for its 12-year uh, operating life so far. And its ability to continue making the uh, profound scientific discoveries and collect the valuable data that it uh, does every day is really enabled by our ability to keep the spacecraft uh, healthy and scientifically relevant um, by updating and servicing that spacecraft on orbit and continuing its mission. Um, in that capacity, the servicing of the telescope and its operation has really become the premier example of the synergy between manned and unmanned spaceflight, and it's really become our point to example of uh, the value of the ability to do this kind of mission. The Space Shuttle Program and the Hubble Space Telescope programs are going to continue this wonderful collaborative effort with uh, STS-109 in what Rob accurately described as one of the most challenging missions that, uh, that we have undertaken to date with five very, very complex and uh, uh, difficult EVAs. Um, the whole process of putting one of these missions together is extremely difficult, extremely uh, challenging for the people involved, and we've had the benefit of a wonderful joint activity and joint effort between both the Hubble uh, team members at Goddard and the Space Shuttle team, including the people here at Johnson Space Center, and as well as the uh, processing folks at Kennedy Space Center. It's really fascinating to watch this process uh, from the program office position and see the amount of teamwork that's required and all of the different pieces that have to come together to put one of these missions uh, uh, into space and to accomplish it successfully. Um, we performed the flight readiness review for this mission yesterday at Kennedy Space Center uh, and reaffirmed the launch date of the 28th of February. As most of you are aware, this is the return to flight for OV-102 Columbia uh, after its down period for maintenance. And as we bring this vehicle back to flight, uh, it's got a number of upgrades to bring it up to more current standards with the fleet. The most visible of those kinds of upgrades will be, of course, the addition of MEDS or the glass cockpit, which we have flown a couple times uh, previously on OV-104. Uh, in addition, we've added the wireless video system, which, uh, again, has flown before, but we'll be using that during the spacewalks for the crews to be able to bring down real-time video from the helmet cameras uh, during the EVAs. <clears throat> and there are, uh, there are a, a great number of other upgrades to the vehicle that are less visible, but uh, as I say, bring the vehicle back up to the more current standards of the fleet. We've done a lot of extensive wiring inspections. Some of you remember uh, the, the period of intense wiring inspections of the fleet that we did about a year ago. That was really instigated by OV-102. Uh, wiring concerns that we found during inspections, and those have all been taken care of during the down period. As I said, we completed the FRR yesterday and reaffirmed the launch date of the 28th, but we do have a number of, of uh, pieces of open work that we have to accomplish between now and then. There are some uh, uh, activities ongoing, as I think most of the community are aware now, we're going to be changing out 
uh, the reaction wheel assembly that we were going to be carrying into space to replace on the Hubble Space Telescope. We've decided to replace the unit that we have installed in the flight support equipment at the Cape with a second unit, which we're preparing in Goddard right now. And uh, in addition to that, uh, there are a number of orbiter issues that we're working. These are the kinds of things that we routinely have to close out in the last couple of weeks of flight. Uh, we have some issues that we're looking at with some bolts on some hydraulic pumps. Uh, we did, however, proceed this morning, uh, yesterday, I'm sorry, with the APU hot fire, the auxiliary power unit hot fire, which tests the integrity of the hydraulic system. And that uh, appears to have come out well with only a couple of sensor anomalies that are being chased down now. But we do have some analytical work to, 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 to go in front of us to uh, clear those pumps for flight, and we're still working on those issues. Assuming all of that stuff uh, gets completed as we expect it to, we are planning to launch on the 28th. We'll be starting the countdown on the morning of the 25th at about 10 o'clock uh, local time at the Cape. Uh, a few hours after the crew arrives, uh, they'll be going down in the wee hours of the morning uh, on that day. This launch is early in the morning. It's uh, 6.48 local time at the Cape, Eastern Standard Time. And the crew day, as we get on orbit, will be in the uh, uh, nighttime hours here in Houston. So the crew is going to be starting their circadian shifting earlier, and uh, will be arriving at the Cape in the middle of the night, as I indicated. Um, I think uh, that gives you sort of a, a flavor of how this mission fits into the scheme of things and the programmatic perspective. And with that, I think I'd like to turn it over to Brian Austin to give us the details. All right, well, thank you, and good morning. I think as Phil has mentioned and uh, Rob also said, this is a, an exciting mission. It's uh, for the Hubble telescope, uh, having been up on orbit and in operations for 12 years, it, it uh, is routinely expanding our knowledge and understanding of, of the universe. And as such, I think STS-109 is going to expand our ability to conduct complex and intensive space-based repair and assemblies. And uh, I think you'll see that play out through our five EVAs on this mission. As Phil mentioned, this is the fourth uh, servicing mission for the telescope. Uh, with these five EVAs, uh, each day is going to be uh, action-packed, if you will, uh, uh, such a tight choreographing of the, of the activities with the crew and the ground team, uh, I think will all uh, keep us on the edge of our seats uh, watching as, uh, as the EVAs play out. Once the mission completes, though, uh, and we've completed everything that we've set out to do, we'll, uh, we'll leave the telescope in a much better uh, posture than we found it, uh, hopefully increasing its discovery potential by 10 times and uh, increasing the, the capabilities with the system upgrades in order to realize that. I could have the picture of the, the flight crew, or the flight directors, if you will. Um, to the far right, if you're looking at the picture, of the Aston Entry flight director is John Shannon. Uh, next to John and to his right is uh, Tony Sakachi. This will be Tony's first flight, and he'll be the Orbit 2 flight director. Uh, in the middle, myself, I'll be the Orbit 1 flight director and uh, directing the EVAs as well as the rendezvous and the deploy activities. And then to the far left of the picture is Jeff Hanley, who will be the, the Orbit 3 flight director. Our flight crew uh, spent a great amount of time working with them uh, in preparations for this mission, and we have an outstanding bunch that uh, is truly ready to go, a seven-member crew. Uh, in the middle and standing tall, uh, the commander, uh, Scott Altman, uh, this is his third mission, uh, and first as a shuttle commander. To his right is uh, pilot Dwayne Carey. Uh, this will be his first mission. On the other side to the commander's uh, left is Nancy Curry. This will be her third flight, and she'll be the prime robotics operator for the mission. The four uh, EVA space mechanics, as I'd like to call them, uh, continuing to, the, to Nancy's left and to the right of the picture is uh, Dr. John Grunsfeld. He'll be the payload commander for the mission. This is his uh, second mission. He was a, a member of the EVA team on STS-103. And next to uh, Mr. Grunsfeld is Dr. John New Jim Newman. Excuse me. It's his third mission, his second uh, to include a spacewalk. And the remaining two EVA crewmen on the, on the other side of the picture, on the outside, is Mike Massimino. This is his first mission, so along with uh, Dwayne Carey, they'll be the rookies on the flight. And finally, the, the fourth uh, EVA crewman, uh, Dr. Rick Linehan, again, his third mission. Uh, this will also be his first mission to include a, a spacewalk. Just to run down some of the orders of the, the EVA crew, uh, Rick Linehan and John Grunsfeld will be paired up on EVAs 1, 3, and 5. 
and then uh, Jim Newman and Mike Massimino will be together on uh, EVAs 2 and 4. As Phil mentioned, uh, Columbia launches, uh, as we've set the date on February 28th at 6.48 in the morning. Uh, because of our due east and low inclination uh, trajectory, we'll have a healthy 65-minute launch window, something that uh, folks may not be used to these days with, uh, with our uh, very short station uh, launch windows. It's an 11-day mission, again, with five EVAs. Um, Something I think that's of, of interest to note is between the, once those five EVAs are completed, we'll have transferred about 6,000 pounds of hardware to and from the telescope. Kind of give you a general comparison between what we do with the, the station miss, missions and our uh, logistics of, of activities there. If I could get the overview graphic for the mission. Quick rundown of our activities, and we'll go into this a little bit more detail in a little bit. Of course, flight day one, the, the launch and the post-insertion activities as we reconfigure the uh, the Shuttle Columbia for on-orbit activities uh, will include two of our rendezvous burns that really set us up on our way to our Flight Day 3 rendezvous. We'll also be activating the, the Hubble Telescope support equipment that's in the cargo bay. Flight Day 2 again picks up the pace. Uh, we'll be doing our uh, thorough check out of this space support equipment for the telescope and the different carriers. Uh, the robot arm uh, will go through its activation and check out as well as each of the four uh, EVA suits. On flight day three will be our rendezvous and grapple and berth with the telescope. Uh, we've moved that as early in the day as, uh, as we can, so right if the crew gets up and uh, through their morning activities, we'll be picking up into the rendezvous. Uh, we've done that in order to allow us some opportunities at the end of the day to retract the solar rays. Uh, both of these solar rays will be coming in. Uh, all things going well, they should, uh, they should roll up within about eight minutes. Uh, each one should take about that long, but um, we've seen on the previous mission that this can take some time, so we want to give us uh, an opportunity at the back end of the day to get this completed to help set the stage for the, for the following EVAs. Of course, EVA days four through eight uh, are five EVAs, and I'll talk a little bit more detail about that, and then you'll get the, an extended view of each of those EVAs later on today. Uh, flight day nine, if we've completed the, all of the activity, will be our day to deploy the telescope. Uh, following that, flight day 10, uh, part of that day will be an off-duty time for the crew, and then we'll begin our cabin stow, and then flight day 11, we'll complete that with our entry systems checkout and preparations, uh, followed by the flight day 10, uh, flight day 12 landing. If I could, before I go on to some more detail, I want to try to do my best to give you a little primer on the telescope. Um, I've got a, a model up here that I'm going to walk through some of the orientations on the telescope and just... Uh, run down some of the key terminology you may hear us refer to. Um, of course, you're familiar with the overall look and, and shape of the telescope, but just some of the different areas. The aft shroud uh, area, uh, the forward shield, the light shield up here, of course, in the, in the aperture door that is opened on orbit uh, for all of our observations. The appendages that are typically out with the high gain antennas on the front and the back, uh, the two solar rays which are deployed. Uh, working our way up through the different bays, as you can see on the different uh, axial bays on the on the aft shroud, we'll be in several of those for several of our different activities. Um, just walking around the telescope, and some of the axes that you'll hear us refer to: the V1, V2, and V3. Uh, the V1 axis will be the long axis of the telescope. The V2 axis will be across the solar ray, so as we refer to the solar rays, we'll be referring to those as the minus V2 or the plus V2 solar ray. And then the V3 axis, uh, if you remember your coordinate system, just completes the right-hand rule, and of course that will correspond across to the high-gain antennas uh, relate to that V3 axis. Uh, some of the different bays that we'll be in on the telescope, um, plus V2 bay will be in to, to do operations with the, the the Nick Moss and the cryo cooler, that'll be on EVA 5. I'm just going to walk around the, the telescope. Uh, the minus V2 bay uh, will be in, to, in here uh, replacing the, one of the science instruments, changing out the faint object camera and replacing that with the, the advanced camera for surveys. Up in our equipment bays, uh, where really most all of the avionics and the, and the power and the heart and soul of the telescope is located, we'll be, we'll be in there for a, for a number of our different activities. Um, bay, bays two and three in, include the battery bays. 
Uh, bay 4 is where our PCU is, or the power control unit will be replacing that. And of course in bay 6, we'll be changing out the reaction wheel assembly, reaction wheel number 1. And you'll most typically see the telescope sitting in a, when you're looking from the aft, aft end of the cargo bay and the views you may see down from orbit, uh, this is pretty much our, our resting position with uh, with minus V3 forward as we'll refer to it. Uh, typically you can look at that and think of the eyes of the telescope looking forward. Uh, when the telescope's in the bay, we'll have the solar rays, uh, excuse me, the high gain antennas will be retracted. Of course, the aperture door will be closed. Um, once we're on the on the structure there, we'll be manipulating the, the telescope around in different orientations to, to have access to the different uh, portions of the of the telescope for our different tasks. In addition to the to the crew on board, we've got our flight control team in Houston uh, who'll be following along with the activities, but we also have an outstanding team of flight controllers at the, the Goddard Space Flight Center and the, the Space Telescope Operations Control Center. They've actually been controlling and, and uh, monitoring the, the telescope uh, day to day. And uh, once we uh, rendezvous with the telescope, uh, our job together becomes much more uh, much more ordered and, and choreographed as, as they'll begin commanding the different uh, portions of the telescope and configuring it to support the EVAs. If I could get the animation, I want to walk through a little bit of the, the details of the cargo bay as we begin our checkouts. As you can see, a pretty full cargo bay. In the front of the bay is the rigid array carrier. This will include our, our new solid panel solar rays. Behind it, the SAC, second axial carrier. Behind that is the, the flight support system, which includes the, the berthing and positioning system, which is our, uh, which will be extended to, to latch the telescope down. And finally, in the back of the bay is the multi-use lightweight equipment carrier, or the mule, as we'll refer to it. And it's also a, a carrier for a, a number of the pieces of the equipment that will be taking off. Of course, the workhorse on the mission that uh, will be busy every day is the remote manipulator system flying that one of the ED crewmen uh, around the telescope. A little more detail on each of these uh, carriers. The rigid array carrier, of course, uh, bringing the, the two new solar ray threes, as we'll refer to those. Uh, they hinge in the middle. They're folded up. They have a mask that, uh, that is hinged as well to put them down into the carrier. And from that, you can pretty much play it back the other way around when it comes to taking them out of the bay and bringing them up to the telescope, um, extending the mast and then bringing them up. Also on the on the carrier, on the outsides of that same carrier, we'll be positioning the, the two uh, solar ray twos that we'll be returning uh, from the telescope. We also have some enhanced dial box assemblies that uh, will be going up to the telescope. And there you see the new solar, the old solar rays. Behind the rack, the second axial carrier, one of the prime duties is to, is to bring our next science instrument up in our, uh, the science protective enclosure, the advanced camera for surveys, and uh, the faint object camera will then be uh, returning home in that same enclosure. On the starboard side of the carrier, the power control unit, And then on the on the port side, another significant piece of equipment is is uh, the Nick Moss cryo cooler uh, that will contribute to the the objectives on EVA five to to regain the cooling on the Nick Moss instrument. We also have some some additional stowage areas on the on the carrier. We have some of our contingency repair uh, latches in the event those are needed. Underneath the carrier, uh, we have some we refer to them as Noble, the new outer blanket layers, uh, insulation fixes on the telescope if time becomes available for that. And again, on the other side, some under pallet storage assembly for some of our other contingency items. I mentioned the flight support system is, uh, is really going to, to help us complete these EVAs as it's done in each of our uh, previous servicing missions. Uh, the BAPS will be extended. Uh, it allows a telescope to be pivoted and rotated. We uh, include a BAP support post in there to help stabilize the telescope and minimize some of the loads that, that it will feel on the solar rays and on the, the high gain antennas. 
There's also a TV inside the, as part of our uh, rendezvous and approach that helps the crew align the telescope. The mule in the back of the telescope uh, pretty much is carrying the EVA-5 equipment. Uh, the ESM or the electronic support module will go toward the uh, the NICMOS cooling system upgrade. We've got a large radiator uh, that will hang off the external face of the telescope. The small, uh, small enclosure at the bottom, or the SOAP, is a number of other contingency tools and contingency uh, items. And then a large ORU enclosure, or the LOAP, and this is where we put the reaction wheel assembly. Reaction wheel will be replacing uh, RWA number one. So following our checkout of all of the systems on flight day two, at the end of the day, we'll be extending the, the berthing and positioning system, the ring, up to its uh, berthing position. Uh, and the latches will be in their proper orientation. Beginning on flight day three and our, after our rendezvous, we'll be uh, slowing things down and coming up on the R bar. This is just the final approach as we approach up to the telescope. Of course, Nancy Curry will be on the operating the arm. We bring the telescope at the orbiter gently up to the telescope and then finally grapple. As you can see by this time the high gain antennas are stowed and the aperture door is closed. Telescope is maneuvered down over the FSS and brought down into its latch position. There's three berthing latches on the on the FSS that uh, will then engage, connect the umbilical and transfer the telescope to our orbiter power. We'll then uh, maneuver the solar rays and prepare for our solar ray retraction. As we slew the arrays, we pivot down in order to clear and then uh, and get a good view for the crew from the aft flight deck as we'll begin retracting the minus V2 solar ray. Once that's completed, we'll uh, bring the telescope around 180 degrees and retract the plus V2 solar ray. Again, each of these should take uh, from start to stop, without stopping in between, of course, about eight minutes. This is a short uh, clip of footage from STS-61. Uh, the solar ray ones were retracted in preparation for change out of solar ray two. Of course, one of those retracted full and the other one had to be jettisoned. Following this, we'll bring the telescope back up to its uh, upright position and prepare it for the next day. Our graphic on the EVAs, if I could, uh, a little bit more detail on each day. One theme I think is, is worth noting, as, as Phil mentioned as well, we have five EVAs. That they are very full EVAs. The tasks are long. Um, we don't have as much of a flexibility in terms of short modular tasks that we might be able to conveniently reorder uh, tasks if we run into difficulties. Uh, in a sense, that complexity has is, is made this mission a little more straightforward in how we planned out these five EVAs. They really only fit in one logical order in some of the interdependencies that uh, occurred with the different uh, tasks. So the way they've laid out on the EVA number one, flight day four, our typical six and a half hour EVA uh, will begin with the minus V2 solar ray replacement. We're also upgrading the diode box uh, to a new uh, technology as well, and that'll, that'll be included with that solar ray. We're also beginning some of our preparations for the PCU, which will be changed out on EVA three. That, uh, that whole task is very long and it's required us to break up some of the front and back end uh, pieces of that and put them on the different EVAs. So we'll also be preparing the PCU with the uh, light shields and thermal covers. EVA 2 uh, will be pretty much a mimic of EVA 1 with the solar rays, just time the other side of the telescope and the plus V2 array. Uh, again, we'll be preparing the PCU task. We'll be removing some of the bolts on some of these bay doors that I mentioned. Uh, the telescope is still in a configuration that could fly away. We're just pre-staging some of the activities so it minimizes what we have to do on, on EVA-3. And at the end of that day, <coughs> fortunately, the, we have a, do have a short task and it's uh, the reaction wheel. It's a well understood task, so we'll, we'll be picking that up at the end of the day and, and rounding out uh, EVA-2. <coughs> Each day really generally build, builds on the previous day. Uh, again, I mentioned the complexities and the interdependencies. Uh, from an efficiency standpoint, it's, it's highly desired to get the two solar rays changed out before we begin the PCU. It allows us some more flexibility in, in uh, disconnecting 
demating connectors. Um, so having, having completed the solar arrays, we'll pick up with uh, the PCU on EVA3. Uh, again, as short as we could take that EVA, it's, it's still planned out to be a seven-hour EVA. So that's not something you've typically seen, but it does include some, uh, some margin in there, some uncertainty time that we went ahead and book kept into the time just, uh, just as a precautionary measure. Uh, we'll begin the day, though, demating the batteries in the telescope. Of course, prior to that time, actually, we've powered down the telescope completely. Uh, first time that's been done with the telescope. Uh, there's been some preconditioning on the, on the vehicle to make sure it's uh, in a good thermally uh, safe configuration to, to go through this period of time that's powered down. Demating the batteries on the telescope and then in preparation uh, for demating the number of connectors and removing the PCU and changing it out. And once that's completed, uh, remake the batteries, uh, remove these thermal covers that we've extended over some of the thermally sensitive areas as well as the, the fixed head star trackers to protect them from stray light uh, and then call that day a success after what should be a, a very busy EVA for the crew and for the ground team as well, very interactive. Flight day seven is our fourth EVA. Uh, primary objective there, of course, is to install the, the new science instrument. It's, it's been a couple of servicing missions now since we've added a new science instrument, the telescope. Uh, we'll be putting in the advanced camera for surveys the first half of the EVA. While we're in that uh, aft shroud portion of the telescope, we're also installing a, uh, some electronics that supports the NICMOS cooling system upgrade. It also will go toward uh, a subsequent cooling system upgrade that will be uh, included on a future servicing mission. And that'll, that will actually be mounted in front of the the ACS, so obviously there's a logical order that those will be installed in the telescope. And then finally, as I mentioned about the PCU, how it expands across a number of EVAs, uh, we'll be removing these, these thermal covers and light shield covers that, uh, off the telescope and, and uh, clean up from that uh, EVA. Finally, on flight day eight, EVA number five uh, is devoted to the NCS. Uh, we have another piece of equipment with it, the NICMOS cryo cooler. We'll be installing that, and in the second half of the EVA, we'll be taking the radiator that's stowed back on the mule and deploying that, uh, attaching that on the outside of the telescope and routing umbilicals underneath and into the telescope and connecting up to the, to the NCC and to the, to the ESM. As you can see, with, uh, on first two EVAs will be uh, installing the solar array, just a brief animation of how that goes. Uh, on EVA number one, Rick Linehan will be performing the task, and on, uh, on EVA number two, Mike Massimino will be on the arm. This is just a brief animation of, of what that day entails. There's an uh, there's a extensive amount of mass handling that will go on to, to turn this solar array around from, its, from pulling it up out of the carrier and then orienting it to to point toward the telescope and installing it on the telescope. After that, uh, as I mentioned, after on EVA2, we've got a couple of pictures just to orient you on the, the reaction wheel assembly. Uh, this is a photo from uh, some of the training up at Goddard. The lower reaction wheel is the, the one that we'll be changing out. There's two in this bay. And go on to the next picture, please. And this is just a hope our video will be better on the flight. This is a change out from when this, this actually the same reaction wheel was changed out on STS-72 and uh, we'll be replacing it again. Uh, EVA number three, the, the PCU uh, task, as I said, is, is a very complex task. It's, um, it's intensive, it's, it's tedious. Uh, there's, if I could have the picture of the PCU, give you an idea of this. Uh, originally in the design of the, of the telescope, as you're aware, it was, it was designed to be serviced in a number of the, the boxes, the electronics boxes, uh, are EVA friendly. This, this one item, though, had really no intentions initially of being serviced. Um, some folks joke that maybe it should have been welded in. Uh, as it turns out, because of a few failures in it and some of its relays, uh, correlate that to maybe to your, your home uh, electrical circuit box. But we've got some relay problems inside there that are, that are reducing some of the capabilities on the telescope, limiting some of its, its abilities to, to use the full power resources of the solar rays and provide other additional circuit protection. So we need to change it out. It's, it's becoming a, a health risk to the telescope. 
Uh, and with the, the expertise of the engineers and, the, and of our EVA team, uh, we have indeed found a, a way that uh, we can do this and do the part of it in one EVA that, that allows us to get it complete and, and not leave the telescope at risk uh, at the end of the day. On the, on the left-hand side of the, the PCU, if I could go to the next picture, you can see down the side of this there's uh, 34 connectors uh, front and back. There's 17 on the front, there's 17 on the back. Uh, 34 connectors, there's two at the bottom that you can't see at the bottom of this picture, and an additional ground strap connector. So there's a, a large number of connectors that the crew has to, to manipulate. Uh, these are not our typical fully EVA friendly connectors with the big wing tabs on them that make it uh, convenient for uh, an EVA suited crewman with the gloves to manipulate. Uh, so we've worked really hard and to have a special tool that we're going to use to get a good grip on these. and. Um, be able to get through this. But this, this whole compartment is, is rather challenging with the, the door, as you saw, that was open on the left, and the crewman's got to get in there. It's a left-handed task. Uh, visibility is, is reduced. Um, we've done a lot of work training and preparing for this. They have a, a mock-up of this particular uh, piece of hardware, a trainer that the, the crew rehearses with uh, on a routine basis, so I, I think they'll be well prepared for this. The ACS, uh, again, our science instrument uh, for the mission, we have a couple of pictures of that. Uh, you may be familiar with that from previous installations. Uh, about an 800 pound, a little over 800 pound object, the crewman on the arm will be maneuvering this into the, into the aft shroud with one of the other EVA crewmen helping to guide it in. Uh, this is the last, uh, actually pulling out the FOC, is the, the FOC is the last uh, camera that's required the use of the CoStar, which provided a corrective optics to it. So uh, the ACS has its own corrective optics system into it. And once the FOC is removed, uh, we've now eliminated the need for the, for the CoStar uh, to provide assistance for the, the optical corrections. And thus, on a subsequent servicing mission, the CoStar will be coming out and, and be replaced by, a, by another science instrument. After the, as I mentioned, after the ACS is in, we've got the, the ESM that mounts in front of the ACS. I've got a picture just to give you a visual orientation. You can see on the right, um, looking into the aft shroud is where the ACS will be positioned, and then below it, uh, mounted onto the floor and some, some handrails down there uh, is the ESM. On EVA-5, uh, some new hardware. This is a a little out of family in terms of our EVA tasks that we've done. Of course, with science instruments, we're, we're uh, familiar with manipulating those and the handling of those masses uh, on the, the servicing mission. On the EVA-5 with the, the Nick Moss cooling system, it really is some, some new uh, activities for us. I've got a couple of photos that i like to, to walk you through. Uh, this is the Nick Moss cryo cooler that will be mounted in the telescope, and then uh, following that, We've got the radiators you can see in the NBL and their, their water runs, the crew hanging this, this rather thin radiator onto the external face of the telescope. There's an umbilical you can see in the front of that, um, the, the white shrouded part that, that will then route underneath the telescope and up into the a vent valve under the, the base of the telescope and then those umbilical connections will be uh, carried across inside and mounted to the, the NCC and then to the, uh, to the ESM. Uh, boxes. So after we're through, the, the telescope will carry a, a, a noticeably different look. The, the new solar rays will be a little smaller, uh, of course, in this external face. You probably won't, the radiator probably won't be that noticeable on the telescope, but it will take on a, a somewhat different look. At the end of EVA-5, uh, we do have planned a, a reboost of the telescope. Um, if we have the propellant available, it's, it's on the order of a highly desired activity. Um, and again, we'll, we'll look forward to taking advantage of that to, to help carry the telescope back up a little bit and, and, and uh, maintain its orbit in preparation for the next servicing mission. Next animation is a, a short play of our ungraf um, unbirth and release of the telescope on flight day nine. Pretty much a, similar to how it came down on the telescope. We'll have the high gain antennas deployed at the end of EVA-5 in preparation for release. After it's unberthed off the FSS, the aperture door will be open, and this should be our final uh, constraint on the telescope to releasing it after it's been commanded and, and ready to go. We'll release and back away.
And as I mentioned before, the rest of the mission uh, hopefully will be a full of celebration and, and uh, quieter times after these five EVAs. Uh, each, of the, each of the equipment goes through a, a quick aliveness test as, as we hook it up just to make sure that uh, uh, it's, it's awake and we don't have to go back and check any of the connections. And then overnight on each day we go through a, a full functional test on each of the, each of the elements uh, to assess their capabilities and, and whether we need to go deal with them again on the next day. Uh, the flight day 11 activities after we've, well, excuse me, flight day 10, as I mentioned, off-duty day with the crew. Uh, they've got their press conference toward the end of the mission and then uh, deorbit and landing. So I, th I think the theme that you've uh, hopefully gathered from this with five EVAs, uh, each of these days are long days, uh, complex. Some of them are tedious. They're all intensive, and they have a great amount of interaction between the, the flight control team in Houston, the crew on board Columbia, as well as the, the telescopes team up at the, the Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, we've had extensive rehearsals of these, uh, each of these EVA days, and I think the team is, is ready to go. We're extremely excited about getting this mission underway and, and look forward to coming back and telling you all about the, the wonders of the telescope. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about SM3B in general, and you're going to hear a lot of details later. Um, I think you've already heard some specifics from uh, Johnson Space Center. Um, SM3B is the most technically challenging servicing mission that we have done to date. And the reason for that is that uh, we are now very ambitiously going after fixes to things that were not originally designed to be serviced in orbit. Uh, Preston is going to show you some details of that, and he's going to show you why we think it can absolutely be done. But it is also, these are also very ambitious and very technically challenging things to do. Uh, we're, we're also fixing things that we never uh, thought had to be fixed. And the example of that is the infrared cameras having its uh, cooling device replaced because the original coolant evaporated a lot faster than, than we thought it was going to. We lo lost the capability of that camera early, and now we're going in to fix something again that was in the original concept of Hubble was not even on the drawing board. Um, now, all of this is practiced for hours and hours in the neutral buoyancy lab, which is the underwater tank uh, on models underwater. That gives you neutral buoyancy, but it is an, not an exact physical replica of how things operate in space. And uh, so I was going to um, show some examples of why, while on the one hand the practice is very important, <laughs> on the other hand you simply can't imitate all the things that are going to happen and all the conditions that are going to happen. And in a minute I'd like to start the video, but let me just do, describe the first image that you're going to see because these images are very abstract and uh, it helps to hear a little description. You're going to first see a short image of uh, Hubble attached to the shuttle, and in the background you see the terminator of Earth. And the terminator is the astronomer's term for the, the day-night transition. So I think you can roll the video now. Um, what has happened here is that we've just gone into sunset, and behind the, the shuttle you see the, the, er, the illuminated Earth, and then you see the darkness, and that's actually the terminator. So that you know, you get these beautiful chiaroscuro effects when you're up in orbit. That happens every 90 minutes. Um, now I wanted to show an example of one of my favorite incidences in the first servicing mission. This is uh, what you're seeing here is Story Musgrave on the end of the arm. Uh, that was Claude Nicolier operating the arm, and the guy on the tether is Jeff Hoffman. Now what has happened here is they've just opened up the, the solar array drive electronics Again, something that was not designed for servicing mission, and, and Story, masterful astronaut that he was, still managed to back it off one turn. This little bolt was backed off one turn too many, and it escaped. So this is not something you simulate underwater, partly because now soon you're going to see them eyeing this thing, and um, I think Jeff has already got it in his view, and that's why he's moving down, and there you see Claude Nicolier is starting to move the arm 
Now, if any of you remember this incident, Nicolier from inside the shuttle saw the bolt, moved the arm, and Story Musgrave captured it between his thumb and his forefinger. This happened in three dimensions in real time, as fast as you're seeing it happening here. So on the one hand, practice is really important. On the other hand, you're, you're having some circumstances up there that are different than happen underwater. And if a bolt escaped underwater, it would drop. Well, uh, in orbit, it doesn't drop. It, it continues with the inertia that it already had. So, uh, you know, these guys are really good. The guys and gals, the next one I'm going to show you is uh, Kathy Thornton, um, who's uh, called KT. Uh, these guys and gals are really good at what you do. If you remember this one, um, uh, KT has the solar arrays in her arms there. She's just released her arms there, and she's being pulled away on the arm. And the solar array is out there. Now, of course, the reason the solar array had to be jettisoned was that there was a kink in it, and you couldn't, uh, you couldn't retract it again. You know, it was like a blind. You couldn't retract it to bring it down. And so in a, in a second here, you'll see the shot of just the solar array as the, as the shuttle has moved away from it. We don't expect this to happen this time. Of course, we're also changing out the solar array this time. Um, there it is. It's, uh, you know, again, spectacularly beautiful. You you see the illuminated earth behind it. And in a minute, what you're going to see is that when the shuttle uh, moves, of course, it shoots out a little bit of exhaust. And that causes the solar array to flap. Like it looked exactly like wings. And it's just about to hit here, that flap. Um, so again, you know, they didn't know they'd have to throw that thing away. Of course, it burned, on, uh, burned up in orbit. It was not a danger to throw away. Uh, I think, it, oh, <laughs> they, they were showing it again. I missed it. Um, we don't expect this to happen with the solar array this time because we've had no indication that there's a kink in it. When they re redesigned the original solar array, one of the things they did was strengthen the frame so that it would retract. So this is something we don't expect to do. Uh, and as you know, the new solar arrays that are going on are stiff. They're, they're smaller. They, I don't think they're quite as aesthetically pleasing because they don't have that gorgeous expanse. They're not the full size of the telescope, but they're more powerful so they'll give all the instruments more power. Um, now, the third shot I'm going to show you is when COSTAR was being put in. And this is another example where underwater you can practice moving, moving something. But large objects have a different inertial behavior up in space than they do down there. And the fact is, it, the difference is moving something on sand and moving something on ice. When you're underwater, you're in gravity, you've got the water, things are hard to move. When you're in space, they move very easily. And um, so often when you see the astronauts pull a big box out that they're starting to work with, you'll see them do these little these little adjustments, because they have to get the feel of it. They've practiced for hours underwater. But these things behave differently. You don't want to move something big real fast. You want to move it real slow. And uh, so these are some, these are some, my favorite, uh, some of my favorite shots, uh, you know, greatest hits from, from previous servicing missions that I think demonstrate the difference between practicing underwater and being in the real life situation and uh, just also demonstrating things like how, how adaptive the astronauts are at um, changing their mindset from working underwater. Uh, you know, another example of the difference between underwater and space is that the gloves behave very differently. When you're in space, you're working with pressurized gloves, and it takes real strength to move the gloves. So when you're, when you're in water, it's, it's fairly easy. So something like grabbing a bolt, it, it's just an entirely different movement up in space than it is, it is underwater. Um, just, to, just to make one more point about uh, COSTAR. COSTAR, of course, when it was put up, it was um, correcting two of the instruments. It was correcting the faint object spectrograph and the faint object camera. And it did that with these little um, mirrors that swung into place. They were pretty small. They were perfect correctors because the original mirror was perfectly incorrect. 
Uh, and they corrected those two instruments. Now, of course, the faint object spectrograph was removed in previous servicing missions, and we are in this servicing mission removing the faint object camera and replacing it with the advanced camera for surveys, which you're going to hear about, uh, I believe, uh, later today from the PI Holland Ford. Uh, so the COSTAR is no, is no longer at work up there. We're not taking it down yet until we have something to put in its place, and in the final servicing mission, SM4, um, the CoStar will be removed. Uh, you know, it was one of the, one of the uh, two instruments that, that got the vision back on Hubble. It will be removed and the cosmic, cosmic origin spectrograph will be put in. Um, our, our current plan is that we will do one more servicing mission in 2004, and that mission will be oriented towards getting the best um, instruments, the best current science capability uh, up and operating that we can and also getting the telescope in the most robust condition we can for uh, operating through the end of the decade and then we're developing plans now for bringing the telescope down and what our hope is is to put it in the Air and Space Museum so that uh, so that uh, everybody in the country who has seen these spectacular images over the years can go and see the telescope itself and uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, it is a very beautiful instrument. It's about four stories tall, and it's covered with shiny mylar as a thermal insulator. Uh, so the whole thing sparkles. It, it is not only an excellent scientific instrument, but it is also a, a very beautiful object. Um, and of course, what we, what our hope is, is that we will have the next generation space telescope up and operating before we bring down the Hubble Space Telescope. The next generation space telescope goes into a higher Earth orbit, um, high enough that we cannot service it. So as successful as the servicing missions have been, um, the next generation st space telescope is not being planned for servicing, but it will give us a whole new capability in the infrared it will be one order of magnitude larger mirrors, and uh, it's, the, it's the future that we're working towards in the long term here. So uh, the servicing mission to Hubble is designated 3B, uh, so it's actually the fourth visit to the Hubble to uh, perform major science upgrades and to uh, perform maintenance tasks on the observatory. As uh, Ann uh, mentioned, servicing mission 3B will be by far the most challenging and ambitious servicing mission attempted to date. The mission will require five full days of spacewalking or extravehicular activity by two teams of astronauts. Most of the tasks are very lengthy and they're complex and they will challenge the stamina and the endurance of the astronauts during their spacewalks. To provide some perspective on servicing mission 3B, let's briefly review prior Hubble servicing mission accomplishments uh, with a short animation, if we could roll that. We're going to start uh, first with uh, servicing mission 1. Servicing mission uh, 1, as you recall, was performed in December of 1993. The major challenge was to correct the spherical aberration in the telescope's primary mirror to restore redundancy in the gyros and in some other areas and to minimize or eliminate the periodic twitching of the flexible roll-up solar rays. Highlights of the mission were the installation of a new wide-field planetary camera number two and the CoStar, which corrected the fuzziness in the images. Uh, we also installed four new gyros and uh, new electronics for two of the other gyros. And we also installed improved solar arrays courtesy of our European Space Agency partner. Those were some of the highlights of uh, what we accomplished on uh, servicing mission one. Here you can see the panels uh, graphically being uh, taken off and installed. If it were only that easy. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Someday maybe with advanced robotics. Okay. And here you see the gyros being uh, installed. As Ian mentioned, there's some other uh, equipment installed, things like the uh, solar ray drive electronics. 
servicing mission uh, two, uh, which is the next one we're going to take a quick look at, was performed in February of 1997. Uh, this required, uh, as I recall, four uh, EVA days worth of activity and uh, provided a major boost in Hubble's scientific capabilities. Two new science instruments were installed, which utilized the latest in detector technology. Uh, the Space Telescope uh, Imaging Spectrograph, or STIS, enabled Hubble to gather science data in a single observation that uh, formerly used to take many observations. The NICMOS, the Near Infrared Camera and Multi-Object Spectrograph, extended Hubble's view from the ultraviolet and visible wavelengths to the, to the near infrared. Needed maintenance on this mission included replacement of the fine guidance sensor, the installation of a solid state uh, data recorder to replace one of the old style tape recorders. And uh, in addition, we also changed out reaction wheel assembly number one, which is not shown in this uh, animation. You'll notice the data flow uh, graphics at the bottom uh, indicating an increase in the amount of data that was output from, uh, from the observatory. Servicing mission 3A in December of 1999 was primarily a maintenance mission. Hubble received a brain transplant, which uh, vastly increased its onboard computational powers while significantly reducing flight software maintenance costs. Another solid state data recorder was added to keep, um, to enable Hubble to keep up with the enormous flow of data coming from uh, its new uh, science instruments installed on the previous servicing mission. And another fine guidance sensor was exchanged. In addition, all six gyros were, were changed out on this mission. The next uh, graphic here shows the, uh, the upcoming servicing mission uh, 3B in the animation. Uh, on servicing mission 3B, we will be installing five new pieces of equipment. We will uh, be installing new solar arrays of a totally new design, which will replace the old style uh, flexible type solar panels that have been on Hubble for over eight years. The, the, that is, the current ones have been on there for eight years. Does that show the size of them there in front of those people? Uh, yes, yeah. that's mm -hmm. correct. And we've got some later pictures that show that uh, better. The advanced camera for surveys, or ACS, will provide a giant leap forward in Hubble's imaging capability and will become Hubble's primary source of great images. The NICMOS cooling system will revive the dormant near-infrared science instrument. And the power control unit, which is uh, the central component in uh, Hubble's electrical system, will also be changed out with a fresh uh, spare unit. That's being shown right there. Uh, not shown in this animation is the change out of reaction wheel assembly number one, which will, uh, will also be accomplished on this mission. Servicing mission 3B will carry over 19,000 pounds of equipment to orbit on the Space Shuttle Columbia. Of the 19,000 pounds, about 6,000 pounds is actually equipment that will be installed in the observatory. The uh, first picture that we have coming up uh, shows the arrangement of the equipment in the cargo bay of uh, Columbia. In the uh, forward part of the cargo uh, bay, you see the, the rack, the RAC, the rigid array carrier, which will be carrying the, the, uh, the new rigid arrays and will also be used to return the flexible roll-up arrays when they're removed from the observatory. Next is the uh, SAC, the second axial carrier. Oops, can we back up? We didn't want to move off the uh, previous graphic. The solar, uh, the second axial carrier carries the, uh, the axial instrument to, uh, to orbit. Uh, the flight support system is what I usually refer to as the Hubble workbench that uh, keeps the Hubble attached to the orbiter while we're working on it. It also supplies it with electrical power and enables us to rotate uh, the observatory around and, and pivot it down uh, to uh, facilitate access by the astronauts from working on it. And finally, the carrier behind the flight support system is a small carrier called the MULE, the multi-use lightweight equipment carrier that will be carrying the NICMOS cooling system and, uh, and some other uh, pieces of equipment, uh, namely the uh, reaction wheel assembly. 
Okay, let's um, take a look at the five pieces of new hardware that we're going to be installing on the observatory during the mission. Uh, the next picture shows the uh, change out of the reaction wheel assembly uh, on the observatory. Uh, Hubble has four uh, reaction wheels and uh, they're the only means of, of controlling uh, Hubble's uh, attitude. We have no uh, uh, jet uh, or rocket uh, uh, capability on there, so everything is done through the use of these inertia wheels. Uh, the wheels work on the principle of spin momentum, so when we change the speed of the wheels, that Im imparts a torque to the observatory and uh, moves it around. And we, uh, we need a minimum of three wheels to, to maintain uh, control of the observatory at all times, and Hubble has a fourth one for, uh, for redundancy. Uh, we use all four wheels together all of the time because that enables us to move the observatory at maximum speed from one target or star to, to the next. Uh, reaction wheel number one experienced a glitch uh, shortly before uh, the servicing mission back in uh, November. Uh, we had a drop out of the wheel speed telemetry and uh, so the onboard computer uh, did not have knowledge of how the wheel was performing. Uh, the electronics experts reviewed the failure and determined that, uh, the, that this failure uh, or anomaly was likely to return and ultimately become a permanent failure. And so uh, we decided it would be prudent to change the wheel out on the servicing mission. Uh, the uh, picture that was just up also showed how the, uh, the wheels are uh, configured on uh, Hubble. Uh, reaction wheel number one is located at the bottom of equipment bay uh, four in this uh, photograph that's on the left hand side of the graphic that you see. Each of these wheels weighs about 104 pounds. You can see a white sort of U-shaped handle on each one that facilitates uh, manipulation by the um, astronauts when they're pulling the old one off and installing the new one. Uh, and these uh, wheels are held in place with three bolts. Uh, the next photo shows uh, reaction wheel number one sitting in its protective enclosure uh, called the LOPE, the large uh, ORU, Orbital Replacement Unit Protective Enclosure, uh, before being installed in the uh, space shuttle to be uh, carried up. And uh, this is uh, located on the, uh, the aft facing side of the uh, mule uh, carrier. It'll take the astronauts approximately an hour to remove the old wheel and, ins uh, and install the new one during the mission. The next picture uh, shows the installation of the advanced camera for surveys. The ACS is an axial type uh, science instrument. It's uh, about the size of a phone booth, weighs about uh, 800 pounds. And uh, this camera contains three channels, uh, a wide field channel, a, uh, a high resolution channel and a solar blind channel. The wide field channel is approximately uh, 10 times more powerful than the current wide field planetary camera 2 instrument. It has twice the viewing area of, of WIFPIC 2. It has five times the sensitivity and twice the resolution of, of the WIFPIC uh, 2 camera. ACS is expected to become Hubble's new workhorse imager. Its fantastic capabilities will keep Hubble on the cutting edge of scientific discovery for many years to come. The ACS will be installed in the location presently occupied by the faint object camera, and later today, Dr. Holland Ford, who's the principal investigator for the ACS, will give you more of the exciting details on this tremendous instrument and its exciting capabilities. We have another uh, photo of ACS that uh, shows a, a reasonable close-up view of it in the uh, clean room at Goddard before it was shipped down to the uh, Kennedy Space Center for installation in its uh, protective enclosure. The, um, the next picture shows the installation of the rigid solar arrays, um, also known as Solar Array 3. These new arrays are needed because the uh, solar arrays that are presently on uh, Hubble have uh, degraded significantly in terms of their performance. Uh, they're only putting out about 63% uh, of their uh, original power. And that's due to the fact that uh, there's been uh, radiation damage to the uh, silicon solar rays, which is a, a normal thing that's expected in the kind of orbit that, uh, that Hubble, Hubble lives in. Uh, but in addition, some of the, uh, the wiring in the, uh, in the blanketing has uh, broken and, and uh, shorted out, and that has also reduced the output of the solar rays. 
Uh, in addition, we've also had some structural uh, problems with, with the arrays with some of the uh, hinge pins that interconnect the solar uh, panel assemblies we noticed on the last servicing mission are starting to uh, separate. Um, the uh, new solar panels that make up Solar Array 3 were procured uh, from a commercial satellite uh, production line, the Iridium satellite uh, line, uh, which was a big help in keeping costs low uh, for the development of this new uh, set of uh, solar arrays. The structure uh, uses an advanced uh, uh, aluminum lithium uh, type alloy uh, that's very lightweight. The smaller size of Solar Array 3 significantly reduces aerodynamic drag, and that will reduce the need for orbital reboosts by the space shuttle and will help prolong the life of the uh, observatory. Uh, the Solar Array uses uh, gallium arsenide type uh, solar cells, which are much more efficient than the current uh, silicon based cells. I have with me today a couple of samples of material. Uh, from the old arrays and the new arrays, just to give you an appreciation for uh, for how they're built, the uh, the current solar arrays use a, a Kapton multi-layer type blanket, uh, and the cells are mounted on on one side. And between the uh, the layers, and there are nine layers, there are only two that are that are shown here. But between these layers are the electrical wires that interconnect the solar cells and carry the power to the uh, to the observatory. And uh, these uh, blankets uh, with the cells on them roll up on a big drum. And, it, and uh, during the uh, course of an orbit, as Hubble goes in and out of the, uh, the sunlight, uh, these arrays expand and contract. And, uh, and uh, the uh, slack is taken up on the drum. And so these, these blankets roll uh, back and forth across the drum. And that's ultimately caused uh, some of the wires to uh, to break and become damaged. New arrays use a um, solid structure to mount the uh, to mount the solar arrays on. It's a aluminum honeycomb structure with um, carbon fiber face sheets, and we mount the cells on one side, and on the back side we run the uh, the wire traces. And this is mounted on a on the uh, aluminum lithium frame that we mentioned uh, earlier. The next uh, picture that we have shows the uh, solar arrays mounted uh, in the rigid array carrier in the clean room at Goddard prior to shipment uh, down to the uh, Kennedy Space Center. And uh, we have a short uh, animation next that shows how the uh, arrays are deployed uh, after they're installed. Uh, what isn't shown here is that in order to deploy them, uh, we need the astronauts to do that. They're, the arrays are manually uh, deployed after they're uh, installed, and then they're, they're latched into a place to keep them from flopping around. These new solar arrays are another excellent example of how we're able to improve Hubble and make it better than when it was new through on-orbit servicing. The next picture shows the power control unit as it looks in Bay 6 of the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, the PCU uh, is a fairly good sized box. It's about one foot thick by two feet wide and four feet long. And it's crammed full of wires and, and relays, basically. It weighs about 160 pounds, including the, uh, the mounting plate that's attached to it. Uh, the PCU has been in service uh, since Hubble was launched, and uh, and so it's about 12 years old, and uh, it's incurred several failures. Four of the uh, four of the relays have uh, failed in it, which has uh, resulted in a loss of about 15 percent of the uh, usability of the current solar arrays. And in addition, there's a faulty bus bar connection that has affected our ability to use two out of the six uh, batteries that are on board the observatory. The, uh, the impedance in this uh, fault is, is variable and, uh, and has the potential to become worse. And, uh, and it doesn't have to become much more worse uh, before we would lose 
the ability to do any science with the observatory. And if the, uh, if the uh, impedance increases sufficiently, it poses a, a real threat to the, uh, the health and safety of the observatory. Um, if the impedance got to be greater than four ohms, if we went into uh, what we call a safe mode situation with our uh, pointing and safe mode electronics assembly computer, uh, it could result in catastrophic heat up of three out of the six batteries. So it's uh, necessary that we change out the, the PCU, and as you can see from the, the photo of it, uh, there are 36 connectors on there that are nested uh, very tightly together and uh, are going to pose a major challenge for the, uh, for the astronauts in, in removing and installing the new uh, power control unit. 34 of the 36 connectors are down one side of it and the other two are on the bottom. And I have with me today an example of the uh, three types of connectors that are, that are used in the uh, power control unit. And if you look at, at your typical uh, astronaut glove, you can see that it's, uh, that it's fairly big and bulky as compared to the size of the connectors and the spacing between them. One of the things that we uh, decided to do was develop a new tool for the astronauts to use to, to remove the uh, connectors with. And so with the gloves, they're able to, to use the tool to get to the connectors. And uh, the connectors operate fairly simply. All they need is a quarter of a turn, and they can be removed. Uh, sounds easy when you're sitting here on the ground in a 1G environment with, uh, without the gloves on. But uh, uh, the real challenge is going to be uh, getting the new uh, connectors mated and, uh, and fully uh, engaged and torqued up. The uh, astronauts have practiced this extensively in the neutral buoyancy uh, laboratory that uh, Ann mentioned earlier. And uh, when we first started working on this, this project back in, in uh, around 1993, there were a lot of people thought that uh, this was just about an impossible task to be done. It was never intended that this box would be changed out. Uh, but uh, with a lot of uh, hard work on the part of the astronauts and the engineers, uh, We've, uh, we have uh, gotten the time down significantly. Um, changing out the PCU will require pieces of three EVA days. It will require one whole day just to change the box out with all the connectors. And the day before and the day after the change out will be devoted to preparing the observatory uh, for powering down. This will also be the first time that we've ever powered down uh, Hubble since we've been on orbit. And um, so we're installing special protective thermal covers to keep critical components warm so that they're not damaged. And then on the day after the uh, PC is installed, we'll, uh, we uh, will remove those covers. The next picture shows the installation of the NICMOS cooling system. Uh, the uh, three cameras in the, in the NICMOS uh, instrument must be cooled uh, to approximately 75 degrees Kelvin in order to operate uh, properly. And this uh, was achieved originally with the instrument when it was first installed through a, a device known as a cryostat. Basically, it looks like a big beer barrel. And it's uh, about the size and shape of a beer barrel. And it's filled with uh, solid uh, nitrogen. And uh, as Ann uh, mentioned, the uh, nitrogen uh, ultimately sublimated or evaporated out of the, uh, out of the cryostat. And uh, when it was all exhausted, the, uh, the, the camera was uh, rendered useless in terms of being able to, to perform science. So we've uh, built a, uh, a device known as the NICMOS cooling system, which utilizes a uh, small cryogenic uh, refrigerator. Uh, the, the NICMOS cooling system has three main elements in it, the, uh, the cryo cooler, itself, which has a little compressor in it that uh, spins at about uh, 400,000 revolutions per minute, if you can imagine that. Uh, an external radiator that uses capillary pump loop technology to get the heat out of the, uh, the cooling system. And then uh, the electronic support module that, uh, that operates the, the whole uh, gizmo. Uh, the NICMOS cooling system is an experimental uh, technology demonstrator. It was first uh, uh, demonstrated in space on STS-95, which was the John Glenn flight, and it worked very well. It was done back in 1998. And um, the next picture that we have here uh, shows the radiator. This will give you an appreciation of the size and location of the, of the cooling system radiator. You can see the technician standing at the bottom. 
Uh, Dr. Ed Chang is the lead scientist for the Nicholas Cooling System, and later today he'll provide more exciting details about this amazing device uh, during his part of the press conference. In conclusion, uh, as you can see, servicing mission, uh, uh, the SM-3B astronauts have an enormous job ahead of them. Two of the five uh, items that they'll be installing, uh, namely the power control unit and the NICMOS cooling system, are outside of the previous Hubble servicing uh, experience space. Every minute of EVA time throughout the five EVA days will be precious. To maximize the probability of success, the astronauts in this mission have trained harder than on any previous Hubble servicing mission. The last photo shows the clean room at Goddard, where the Hubble servicing uh, uh, hardware is tested, and uh, the astronauts learn about the hardware and the tools and the procedures for installing it. Uh, we have a, a video that shows the crew uh, training in the Goddard uh, clean room. Here you can see them uh, learning how to uh, install and uh, deploy the, the new rigid uh, solar array. When they, uh, when they come to Goddard, they know very little about Hubble and, and all of the, uh, the hardware, but when they leave, they're, uh, they're total experts in, in uh, almost every aspect of the observatory. When servicing mission 3B is completed, Hubble will be at the peak of its powers of scientific discovery and a major portion of its electrical power system will have been renewed and enhanced. Some of the tasks being performed in this mission were never imagined or planned for by Hubble's original designers. This mission, when successfully completed, will show that anything uh, and everything, with the exception of uh, Hubble's uh, primary and secondary uh, mirrors, is capable of being repaired, replaced, or enhanced. The first servicing mission of the new millennium will ensure that Hubble remains the world's foremost astronomical observatory during its second decade of operation. Good afternoon. As you've heard from all of the previous briefings, we have five challenging back-to-back -back EVAs. They'll be done on flight days four through eight. John Grunsfeld and Rick Linehan will be doing EVAs one, three, and five. Jim Newman and Mike Massimino will do EVAs two and four. The EV crew members that are not outside participating in a certain EVA will support from inside as the IVA crew members. We started training for this mission in October of 1999. The crew has spent 528 hours in the neutral buoyancy laboratory doing nominal timeline training as well as some contingency and cross training. We're flying four large EMUs, so each crew member has his own suit. In addition, we have a full set of spare soft goods suit components. Flight day two, the crew will check out all four of the EMUs and they'll begin doing tool preparations for EVA-1. EVA-1 is the change out of the minus V2 solar array and the minus V2 diode box. We'll also be doing some get ahead tasks for EVA-3. Can I have the EVA-1 video? On 61, the original solar arrays were replaced with second generation arrays. On this mission, we'll be replacing those arrays with new rigid arrays, which are also called third generation arrays. Prior to EVA-1, both solar arrays will be individually retracted. If one of those arrays doesn't retract, then we won't be able to stow it on the carrier and we'd have to jettison it. As you know, this is what happened with one of the arrays on the first servicing mission. The first task is to fold up the array so that we can stow it on the carrier. John will be in the foot restraint at the base of the array. Rick is at the top in the arm. John will manually retract the array. Once it gets towards the top, Rick will hold it and stabilize it so that John can engage a lock. The next task is John will demake the solar array connectors from the diode box. While he's doing that, Rick is going to do a get-ahead task for EVA-3. He'll install a thermal cover on the wide-field planetary camera, and then he'll position protective covers over the fixed-head star trackers. This is the solar array removal. John disengages the clamp that held it to the telescope, and then Rick pulls it away and heads for the carrier. This array is stowed on the starboard side of the carrier. As Rick brings it in, John will help him guide it into its latches. This is the diode box change out. The diode box ensures that power flows from the solar array to the batteries and not in the reverse direction. The yeah, new diode box that's being installed has some additional features that the old one didn't have. This is Rick removing the new rigid array. It's 640 pounds. 
12 feet by 8 feet when it's folded in half as you see it right now. After he removes it, he'll be positioned over the starboard side of the bay where he'll rotate it around for installation. Once it's installed, John will engage the clamp to secure it to the telescope. Then John will make the solar ray connectors to the new dial box. Rick will deploy the panels. After the panels are at 180 degrees, Rick will engage two bolts to keep them secured. This is the flight array deployment. You're looking at the back side, the inactive side, which is just simple panel support structure. The side you can see now is the active side that has the solar cells. These arrays are about two-thirds the size of the original arrays but have about 25% more power. The last task for the day is the P601 harness mate. The telescope is rotated 90 degrees for this. The crew members also switch positions on the arm, so now John is on the arm for this task. Early in the EVA, John routed a harness from the dial box to an external power port on the telescope. And now he's plugging in a cable into that power port. This will provide power to a dial box controller, which is actually a sub-assembly of the dial box. While John's doing that, Rick will be doing another get-ahead task for EVA-3. He'll pre-position thermal blankets on bays 5 and bays 10. After this, the crew will do a payload bay cleanup, and then they'll ingress the airlock. And that completes EVA-1. EVA-2 is the replacement of the other solar array and the other diode box. We'll also be changing out the reaction wheel assembly. The solar array and diode box task looks the same as what you just saw for EVA-1, so my video won't repeat that. I'll just pick up with the reaction wheel task. Mike Massimino will be on the arm for the duration of this EVA, and Jim Newman will be the free floater. Can you start the EVA-2 video? This is the reaction wheel handoff. The reaction wheel has been removed from phase six. Uh, Mike's on the right-hand side of the screen. He just received the new wheel from Jim. They do this handoff at the aft starboard side of a mule carrier. This is footage from SDS-82, Mark Lee installing wheel number one. After the wheel is positioned and seated, he'll engage three keyway bolts and mate four connectors. completes EVA-2. EVA-3 is a replacement of the power control unit, or PCU. In order to do this task, the telescope will have to be completely powered down. At the beginning of the EVA, the crew will install and deploy various thermal covers to protect sensitive components on the telescope for the duration of this power down. They'll also demate the battery connectors to isolate power flow to the PCU. This will be a very challenging EVA as you've heard today uh, for many different reasons, one of which is that the PCU was not designed to be changed out EVA. Uh, when they did the initial upgrades for the telescope to make boxes more EVA friendly, PCU was not included in that upgrade. And the main thing that makes it challenging from an EVA perspective is the number and types of connectors that it has. On SDS-82, when Mark Lee was replacing the data interface unit, we gained more of an appreciation for how difficult this type of connector can be. Because of that experience, Goddard designed a new connector tool, and they also built a PCU trainer that the crew uses weekly. Can I have the EVA3 video, please? The first task is deploying and installing thermal covers. John will install thermal covers on both diode boxes, then he'll deploy thermal covers over base 5 and base 10. At the same time, Rick will be demating battery connectors. Those batteries are located in both bays two and three. There's actually three batteries inside each bay. They're housed together in one unit. Next, John will deploy fixed head star tracker covers. When the telescope is powered down, the shutters will automatically open, and this could let stray light into the telescope. And to prevent the light from getting to the sensitive optics, uh, thermal covers are deployed. Sorry, protective covers. This is John deploying the right-hand side fixed head star tracker cover, and I apologize for the jumpy video that you have. Um, it's folded up sort of like an accordion, and it deploys like a mini blind. It's got a retractable tether that makes it easy to retract at the end of the day.
Next we go into Bay 4. This is where the PCU is. Rick will be doing Bay 4 PCU setup. Before we start doing the connector DMATE, he'll install a couple of pieces of hardware that assist us with that DMATE. This is a shot looking inside Bay 4. The PCU is a large box in the middle. To the left side of the box, there are 34 connectors. They're two rows deep and they're grouped together very closely. On the bottom of the box, there are two connectors. On the inboard side of the door, you see four smaller boxes. Those are power distribution units. Each one of those boxes has three fuse plugs sticking out of it. We'll have to remove the six inboard most fuse plugs in order to get access to the PCU connectors. Next photo, please. This is a view of our trainer here at JSC. A couple of the items that are required for PCU setup have been installed. At the very bottom, there's a blue bar that's holding the door open. This is a manual door stay that's flying for the first time on this flight. They'll install this and leave it there to help them keep the door open for the duration of the task. Just to the left of the PCU connectors, you can see a white board that has some white loops on it. That is the harness retention device. That'll be used to restrain all of the connectors once they're demated. Next photo, please. This is a close-up of that harness retention device. You can see some of the connectors have been demated and they're stored in these white loops. Can you start the video again? This is the start of the PCU connector demate. Rick starts from the top of the box and then works his way down. You'll notice on the left side there's not a lot of room for a gloved hand access. He uses this connector tool for the whole demate sequence and the remate looks very similar. After he has a harness demated, he'll stow it in one of the white loops. John Grunfeld actually completes the last part of the connector demate and then removes the box. Here he's bringing it down for the change out. Rick will be in a foot restraint retrieving the new PCU. After they switch boxes, John will head back to Bay 4 for the installation. After he installs the PCU, he'll engage the bolts and then begin the connector remate and then do some cleanup items in that bay. The last task is a battery reconnect. John will do this for both Hubble bays, two and three. Right now he's removing caps that were on the battery and replacing the original harness. While John does this connector remake for the battery bays, Rick will be retracting the thermal covers that we installed at the beginning of the EVA. And that concludes EVA 3. EVA 4 has two main objectives. The first one is to install the advanced camera for surveys, or ACS. The second is to install the electronic support module, or ESM. We'll also be doing some cleanup items from the PCU EVA. Advanced camera for surveys will be replacing the faint object camera, or FOC, which is the last of Hubble's original axial scientific instruments. The electronic support module is a control box for the cooling system that will be installed on EVA 5. We start the EVA 4 video. Jim Newman will be on the arm and Mike Massimino is free-floating for the ACS task. Jim will open the doors to remove the old instrument. As he's removing it, Mike will be giving clearance calls. After Jim removes it, he'll temporarily store it on a fixture that houses it over the port side of the vehicle. He'll pit pin it here in place and leave it here until the advanced camera is installed. This is footage of the faint object camera removal. This is just to give you a size comparison of the instrument and the crew member. All of the axial science instruments are about the size of a telephone booth. Next, we'll be installing a cross aft shroud harness or cache. This is actually part of the cooling system. It's unrelated to the ACS task. We're just doing it at this time because the bay is empty and we have more clearance inside the bay. The cache will mate two of the cooling system boxes or link them together and it'll provide power and data between them. Jim hands it into the aft shroud and Mike, who's already inside, will help guide it through and then they'll connect it to two inside handholds. Next is the advanced camera retrieval. It's 
held in place by two latches. Jim will disengage one of them and then Mike will get the other and Jim will remove the box. This is the front face of the advanced camera. You can see the two EVA handholds, the short gold one and the long L-shaped silver one. As Nancy Curry flies Jim into the telescope, he'll hold the box against the lower left guide rail until it's coarsely positioned. At that time, Mike will deploy an alignment aid to help with fine positioning. This alignment aid's flying for the first time on this mission. Uh, they chose to, to design something to help with the misalignment problems that we've had on past servicing missions. The last part of this is to stow the old instrument. After they get this stowed, they'll switch positions on the arm, and Mike Massimino will now be on the arm for the duration of this EVA. Next is the electronic support module retrieval. This is located on the aft port side of the mule carrier. Because the arm can't get all the way down into the aft part of the bay here, the free floater will retrieve this box. Here they're working together to get the box. Jim has just removed it and he's handing it up to Mike. After Mike gets the box, they'll both go to the front side of the telescope to install it together. The ESM will be placed on a bulkhead floor directly in front of the advanced camera. It'll be latched to a center guide rail and a bulkhead handrail. This is a view of it after it's been installed and latched. Jim is routing a Y harness from the CoStar instrument that will be used to provide power to the electronic support module. After they finish the mating the connectors to the electronic support module, the crew will close the aft shroud doors and then they will do some PCU cleanup tasks. They'll be basically doing the reverse of the get ahead tasks that I mentioned on EVA 1. The main goal of EVA 5 is to install a cooling system to regain the science capability of the NICMOS instrument. There are two main parts of this. The first is installation of the NICMOS cryo cooler. As folks have already discussed, this is basically a pump that contains neon that will be pumped into the NICMOS instrument. So this will be installed inside of the aft shroud. During the second part of the EVA, we'll install a radiator, which will be on the external part of the aft shroud, and that radiator will be used to cool the NICMOS cryo cooler. So we start the EVA 5 video. First task is to install the cryo cooler. Rick will do this, we'll take it off the carrier, and then install it directly in front of the NICMOS instrument on the bulkhead floor. This is Rick retrieving the cryo cooler. It's about 300 pounds. The black hoses, or what look like hoses, on the top right corner of the box are actually the neon lines that will be plumbed into NICMOS. It's latched to the bulkhead floor in the same manner that the ESM was at the end of EVA 4. Next is the radiator retrieval. This is launched on the aft side of the mule carrier. It takes both crew members to retrieve this. They'll install it in between the minus V3 and plus V2 sides of the shroud and latch it to the upper and lower handhold. This is a photo just prior to the installation. Both crew members work together to align it and engage the latches. This just gives you a good size comparison also between the radiator and crew members. This is a flight radiator installed on one of the Goddard mock-ups. It's about 13 feet by 3 feet. We start the video. The last task is a conduit installation. The conduit contains electrical harnesses and an ammonia line. It will be rotated 270 degrees and routed through a hole in the bottom of the bulkhead of the telescope. Connectors will then be mated to the cryo cooler. This is a view of the last portion of that harness routing. Rick is in a foot restraint, stabilizing the conduit. John is inside on the arm, pulling the lines through. After they finish connecting up all of the harnesses to the NICMOS cryo cooler, they'll close the aft shroud doors and then do a final payload bay cleanup and preparation for landing. That completes the series of five EVAs. I do have some tools that I'd like to show you that are flying for the first time on this flight. This is called the Articulating PFR Extender. 
this was designed for use with a solar array task. It could have other future, future uses, but that's what we're using it for in this mission. So we'll be using it for EVAs one and two. What this does for us is this allows us to install a foot restraint in the socket here, and then we can change the worksite orientation of the foot restraint by swinging this back and forth. This prevents us from having to remove the foot restraint continually. With the solar ray task, we're moving back and forth across the mass, so we have to work on the left side of the box then the right side. This has saved us about 15 minutes of EVA time on both EVAs 1 and 2 for a total savings of about 30 minutes. This is the old connector tool, and these are, these are all water mock-ups that I'm showing you, so you'll notice that a lot of them are, are somewhat beat up. But this is the connector tool that we used, for example, for the data interface unit task that we've used on all the previous servicing missions. We are flying it, but we're not using it as a primary tool any longer. This is the new connector tool that was designed. It has two major improvements. One is that it has more leverage or mechanical advantage. They've changed the geometry of the tool by moving the pivot point, so when the crew grips the connector, they'll get more leverage at the top. The second thing they did was they changed the, the geometry, the orientation of the pad to the top of the jaw. So when they clamp a connector, they'll get more uh, surface area contact on that connector, and that hopefully will allow us to get more torque for demating and mating the connectors. This is the manual door stay. You saw this in the picture, but you probably couldn't really tell what it was. Um, we have an old door stay that's used to keep some of these doors open, but it uses a tool interface, and it takes a bit more time to install it. This is nice and handy because the crew simply has to use two knobs to engage it to hold the door open. It also has an adjustable piece so they can vary how far the door is open. As we discussed earlier, the PC was not designed to be changed out EVA, so it didn't have a set of handholds. So folks had to be creative for this mission and designed an EVA handhold. They used bolt holes that already existed on the surface of the PCU, and the crew uses this hand wing tab to engage into those bolt holes, and that gives us a PCU handhold. They also have a nice alignment mark here to help them with aligning so that you don't have a blind mate as you're trying to press this in. The last item I have is one of the thermal covers. This is the Bay 10 thermal cover. The thermal cover comes with the Dio box cover temporarily stored on it, and this is just for transportation. So on EVA 1, the crew prepositions these covers. There's one for bay 5 and one for bay 10. There are holes in the cover here. You can see plugs are installed into the bay to secure it to the bay, and it's basically left undeployed like this. And on EVA 3, when they install the dial box thermal cover, they remove this piece, they install this individual piece on the dial box, and then they deploy the full cover, which is, is Velcroed together here. I won't demonstrate the deployment. It's a little too big. Bundesstaat Florida laufen die letzten Vorbereitungen für einen Montageeinsatz der ganz besonderen Art. Am kommenden Donnerstag wollen dort fünf Astronauten starten und Hubble auf den neuesten Stand der Technik bringen. Das Weltraumteleskop liefert seit zwölf Jahren spektakuläre Bilder von fernen Sternen und Galaxien. Von der Nachrüstung erhoffen sich die Wissenschaftler noch tiefere Blicke ins All. Ein Montagetrupp auf dem Weg zur Arbeit. Das Einsatzziel liegt in einer Höhe von rund 600 Kilometern. Hubble, ein Weltraumteleskop so groß wie ein Bus. In den vergangenen zwölf Jahren wurde das Fernrohr bereits dreimal nachgerüstet. Kleine Fehler wurden behoben, veraltete Instrumente ausgetauscht. Jetzt soll Hubble eine neue Digitalkamera bekommen. Eine Hightech-Maschine, die das Potenzial des Teleskopes verzehnfachen soll. Mit der jetzigen Mission wird Hubble wieder auf den neuesten Stand der wissenschaftlichen Technik gebracht. Neue hochmoderne Geräte werden installiert. Hubble selbst wird dadurch zu einem vollkommen neuen Instrument.
1990 wurde das Teleskop in die Umlaufbahn geschossen. Ein Gemeinschaftsprojekt der Europäischen Weltraumagentur ESA und der amerikanischen NASA. Außerhalb der störenden Erdatmosphäre hofften die Forscher auf noch tiefere Blicke ins All. Die Ergebnisse übertrafen alle Erwartungen. Mit einer bis dahin unerreichten Schärfe fotografierte Hubble Galaxien oder die Reste explodierender Sterne. Mehr als 25.000 Objekte wurden beobachtet. Aus den Bildern konnten die Forscher Rückschlüsse ziehen auf die Entstehung des Weltalls. Kein Fernrohr zuvor blickte so tief in den Raum und dadurch so weit zurück in die Zeit wie Hubble. Wir hoffen jetzt, dass wir mit der Digitalkamera ein neues Beobachtungsfenster öffnen können. Wir erwarten erste Bilder vom Planeten außerhalb unseres Sonnensystems. Dann wollen wir Galaxien aus den frühen Jahren der Entstehung des Universums fotografieren. Wir erwarten Bilder, die wir noch niemals zuvor gesehen haben. Zwei Tage soll der Umbau dauern. Schon am kommenden Sonntag soll die neue Kamera dann ausprobiert werden. Einsatz zum Weltraumteleskop Hubble starten. Die Crew soll insgesamt fünf Einsätze im All durchführen. Ziel ist es, die Reichweite des Teleskops zu verstärken. Sollte die Mission misslingen, könnte die NASA die Beobachtungsstation ganz verlieren. Good morning and welcome to our launch minus three day countdown status briefing for our next shuttle mission STS-109. We have with us this morning Steve Altimus, NASA Test Director. Good morning. Scott Higginbotham, the SCS-109 Mission Manager. Good morning. And Ed Perselic, our Shuttle Weather Officer. Hi. And we'll begin our briefing today with uh, statements from each of these, uh, beginning with Steve. Thank you, Bruce. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's been a long road to get Columbia to this point um, in the flow, and we're pleased to be in a position to pick up the launch countdown this morning. Now, the flight crew arrived. Uh, this morning very early at, at 1 o'clock in the morning and they went out to the launch pad to perform their final pre-flight walk down and inspection of the payload before we closed the payload bay doors in the countdown. That walk down and inspection uh, went without issue and uh, we're ready at 9.30 this morning to pick up the launch count. As far, as far as the launch countdown timeline goes, call the stations again will be at 9.30 this morning just after this press conference. Uh, our last access for for the payload will be roughly noon today at L minus 66 hours, at which time we'll go into our payload uh, bay closeouts and pull back the access and close the payload bay doors for flight. And that will occur, they'll be closed for flight by about uh, 8 o'clock tonight. We will continue the countdown and on Tuesday, essentially first shift, we'll load the PRST uh, system, our, our power reactant storage distribution system, with our uh, cryogenics, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. We'll continue the count after we finish that up with our engine final preparations and close out of the tail service mass for flight, and that'll be on second shift Tuesday. Following that, we'll go into a 12-hour, 58-minute built-in hold at T-minus 11 hours, and that will begin early Wednesday morning. During that hold period, we'll start our uh, our orbiter communication system and ground network activation. We'll go ahead and pull back the rotating service structure at 11 a.m. on Wednesday morning and continue the launch countdown to our T minus six uh, hour hold, which is two hours in duration. During that hold period, we'll have a tanking, a mission management team review of all the, any open issues and vehicle systems in addition to a weather review. And we'll, we'll be set coming out of that meeting with a go for tanking, earliest tanking at 9.30 Wednesday evening. The crew activities for boarding begin at roughly 3 in the morning on uh, Thursday morning. And then uh, we'll go ahead and, and continue the terminal count with a 10-minute built-in hold at T-20 and a 40-minute built-in hold at T-9 minutes. And then we'll count down to a launch at 6.48 Thursday morning. The launch window for Thursday for this HST mission is 66 minutes in length. That uh, opens at 6.48, as I mentioned, and extends to 7.54. And for any launch scrub, the launch window moves approximately 30 minutes earlier each day. For landing site status, uh, KSC is obviously the uh, return to landing site uh, um, site. Uh, Edwards is our abort once around site. And for TAL sites, our Our only TAL site this mission is Ben Greer. We're only manning a single uh, site, reason being that there's an overlap between the uh, RTLS abort boundary and the abort-to-orbit um, abort boundary. 
So uh, basically the towel site is highly desirable only and uh, it's, it's there to protect us for any kind of uh, uh, potential system failures in addition to the, the engine out failures that we normally protect for. For end of mission landing, our nominal 12-day uh, mission lands on Monday, March 11th at 5.02 in the morning. For scrub turnaround plans, uh, we have 24 and 48 hour turnaround capabilities. Our plan's uh, turnaround support posture is to try two consecutive attempts, then we'll stand down for a day, go ahead and top off the uh, liquid hydrogen in the TRSD system, and then try two more at launch attempts for four attempts in five days. Uh, the range activity really doesn't affect us until we're out around the March 8th time frame. So in summary, after an extensive uh, modification period that spanned over two and a half years, during which over 133 modifications were incorporated into Columbia. Columbia is poised on the launch pad with all ground and flight systems ready to go and we're ready for launch. Great, thank you Steve. And now for an update on our payload activities. Scott. Thank you Bruce and good morning everyone. Final preparations of the four flight carriers that make up the Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission 3B are continuing very smoothly out at Pad A. We began our final sequence of closeouts at, at 8 p.m. yesterday evening, and they will conclude it around noon today, as Steve indicated. During this closeout sequence, we've done basically three things. One, we had the flight crew come out, as Steve indicated. They did their final walk down at around 2 a.m. this morning to make sure that they were satisfied with the configuration of the payload bay. Second, we disconnected the vacuum pump that was hooked up to the NICMOS cryocooler instrument, which is located on the second axial carrier. This instrument is very sensitive to moisture, and so we've been vacuum pumping on it for as often as we can during the flow here at KSC to keep it as dry as possible. And then lastly, we've had a system, systems engineer walk down where we brought out all the disciplines that have been working on this flow from the very beginning from Goddard and here at KSC to take one last look at the flight hardware to make sure it's in flight configuration. Again, the plan is to remove the access at noon today, and once that happens, the payload bay complement will be ready for launch. The only things that we'll have left to do prior to launch will be a continuous monitoring of the payload bay purge environment, and also the nitrogen purge that's provided to the scientific instruments on the SAC. Those are the NICMOS cryocooler and the advanced camera for surveys. This GN2 purge is provided uh, from the facility down through the mobile launch platform, up uh, through the T0 umbilical into the payload bay and to the second axial carrier. As far as uh, mid-deck experiments are concerned, we have none, as most of you probably know, because this mission is uh, far too hectic and there's not enough room on the mid-deck to accommodate any additional science. And as far as scrub turnaround is concerned, our only consideration is with the NICMOS cryocooler. Once we disconnect it today, we have 14 days to launch before we have to reestablish access to drive the instrument out again using the vacuum pump. So in summary, things are proceeding very well for us out the pad. Our mission processing team has put forward an outstanding effort over the last few months getting this flight hardware ready to go, and we're all looking forward to a launch on Thursday to go service this extremely important scientific instrument. Thanks, Scott. And now for a weather update. Uh, Ed. Thanks, Bruce, and good morning, everyone. Currently, we have a cold front stretching from Texas up into the central Great Lakes. We expect that into central Florida probably Wednesday morning. May have some showers uh, late Tuesday into early Wednesday. Then uh, winds will be going uh, northwesterly and turning uh, windy and colder on Wednesday. And then into Thursday morning, we do have some concerns about low temperatures, which I'll discuss in a little more detail as we get into the forecast. Additionally, just another item of interest, it looks like a pretty rough ride for the recovery ships going out to the recovery area. Uh, probably receives around 13 feet with some strong northwest winds. And it does appear we'll get some abatement as we get into Thursday morning with seas uh, diminishing, and we'll discuss that a little more when we get to that particular graphic. Looking first into tanking, uh, looks like a chilly day, an estimated temp around 50 degrees at tanking time. Strong northwest winds, but no showstoppers. It uh, looks good, very good for tanking. Uh, looking to the uh, launch forecast, probably close to clear, maybe a few clouds around, and uh, northwest winds, and uh, maybe 7 to 10 knots with estimated temperature at the pad 60 foot level of 40 degrees. And uh, <clears throat> just a comment regarding the temperatures. 
If we get uh, five to seven knots, we can actually go down to 38 degrees and still be green. So we've got quite a bit of margin with regard to temperatures. And again, these are at the, at the pad 60 foot level. And uh, one more comment with regard to temperatures. Well, we uh, can analyze the temperatures in five, five minute increments. So we're not red, red until we're 35 consecutive minutes in the red on the graphic. So we can be red for 30 minutes under our temperature constraints, go back into the green, and our 35-minute clock restarts. With regard to the uh, conus uh, recovery area, I'm sorry, it looks like good visibility, some scattered clouds, the winds, an estimated northwest 18 to 22 knots, kind of chilly out there, estimating air temp around 57, sea temp around 72 and see somewhere around 8 to 10, hopefully a little less than that, but uh, right now that's an estimate on the seas. That would still be doable for those folks, so that, uh, just not a fun trip, obviously, for the recovery folks. Looking now to the uh, Kona sites from uh, SMG, <coughs> we'll go to the 24-hour forecast. Uh, a couple of things uh, for thir Friday morning, if we do get into that uh, scenario, uh, First, we still would be somewhat concerned about low temperatures, and that a lot of that would depend upon the low-level winds. If the winds go lighter, we have less margin uh, with regard to our low temperatures, so that's one concern. If the winds go a little more northerly, then we would get the effect of the ocean, and uh, the temperatures would be actually warmer than indicated, so it's kind of a borderline situation. If we were to go a little more northeast, then we'd have a slight concern for the stratocumulus low cloud ceilings coming in off the water. And given all of that, there's still just a 20% chance that weather would keep us on the ground if we do have to go into Friday morning. Looking into Saturday, it looks like a uh, situation similar to what we had last uh, Friday, a 48-hour delay, uh, low pressure in the central Gulf of Mexico, the front that went through us on Wednesday, moving back north, and a fair chance we get a lot of overrunning cloudiness and precipitation. So given that uncertainty, I went 70% chance weather no-go on Saturday for the 48-hour delay. And uh, let's see, do we have the CONUS sites? Maybe. Oh, we did not have them. Hmm. The email didn't make it. Sorry about that. OK, very quickly, on um, for launch day for Edwards Air Force Base, uh, just a few middle and high clouds, uh, winds northeast 7 to 10 knots, so Edwards looks good. White sands, uh, clear skies, light northeast winds. And I'll just walk through the Kona sites first very quickly for you. Edwards on Friday, clear skies, good visibility, northeast winds 10 to 15 knots. And uh, white sands, just a little bit of cirrus, good visibility, northeast winds 7 to 10 knots. And Friday, uh, excuse me, into Saturday at Edwards, still clear skies, northeast winds 10 to 15 knots, clear skies at uh, White Sands, and northeast winds 7 to 10 knots. And looking to Ben Greer, our tail, uh, also forecasting uh, very good conditions there. This is from uh, Wayne Baggett and Carl Silverman at SMG. Ben Greer on Thursday, a little bit of cirrus scattered at 25,000, good visibility, winds north 7 to 12 knots. Friday, if we delay, uh, ceiling broken at 25,000, good visibility, winds northwest 7 to 12 knots. And going to Saturday, Ben Greer, some broken cirrus, 25,000 foot ceiling, good visibility, winds northerly 7 to 12 knots. And I've completed that. Okay, thank you very much, Ed. And let's uh, open it up for questions. Uh, let's start with Marsha. Uh, Marsha Den Associated Press. Um, for Steve, could you? brief us on the latest uh, thinking on the bolts. Okay. Um, for those of you that aren't up to speed, maybe uh, we're currently following discussions uh, concerning the SRB or the orbiter hydraulic pumps uh, attached to the orbiter uh, auxiliary power units. The, the, the bolts that are installed in the hydraulic pumps uh, are dry film lubricated and uh, I guess our uh, indications are that they should technically should not be. So. Uh, we reviewed the orbiter uh, pump data packs, and that indicates that uh, um, the situation is such where the running torque of the bolts uh, would actually be decreased by the dry film lubricant. So that would cause us a tendency to want to pull the inserts out of the pump housing, 
uh, by over torquing the bolts um, and thus uh, causing us uh, maybe potentially some negative margin in that hydraulic pump. Well, they've been ongoing with uh, some stress analysis and some offline testing to verify their analysis and I think they're closing in on a, on a positive story and some good flight rationale and we expect those discussions to conclude at the L-2 uh, mission management team review on Tuesday and uh, come out with a favorable result. Uh, thank you. And uh, also for you, um, is your understanding that the security will be similar to what we experienced in December or will it be greater or less or can you sort of categorize it as compared to the last launch? Uh, you, can, you can bet that the security will be uh, very similar to what we had for 108 and that will be our baseline security plan as we continue on uh, through the next sub subsequent missions. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, Stephen. Um, Steve Seislaw, Florida today. Uh, also for Steve first, um, can you describe the condition Columbia was in when it came back from California? I mean, y'all have had it in the hangar for some time. Well, uh, it comes back uh, with, uh, with quite a few modifications to it, and then we have a very ex extensive review of uh, uh, and requirement testing requirements uh, of the vehicle on the in the orbiter processing facility. That process to get it uh, recertified, if you will, post modification period is extensive and that accounts for the long uh, time it, it spent in the OPF. But we did meet uh, the objectives of that maintenance down period and uh, have, a, have a good vehicle as evidenced by the integrated flow at the, at the launch pad and the vehicle is in, in great shape and ready to fly. So. Thanks. And um, for Scott, uh, the reaction, the spare uh, reaction wheel assembly that you're sending up. Um, I understand that you're going with the uh, the first one that came down here. Do you have the second one on hand or are there any tests that will go on now while the uh, assembly is in the cargo bay to make sure it's still working by the time it lives off? The first wheel is on board and the second wheel is here at KSC. It arrived a week, a week ago last Saturday. and. Um, there is no additional testing required. The one that's installed will fly. Um, at this point, once we install the carriers into the payload bay, there's really no option for an R&R &R without pulling the carriers back out of the payload bay. The, the HST program is, is committed to flying the one that's installed right now. Okay. Bill? Uh, Bill Harwood, CBS. Um, on the security thing, I mean, this may be in one of Bruce's release and I just hadn't read it. I assume it's the same no-fly zone and local airports are shut down from, I guess, midnight or something until you guys launch. Is that all still the same? Well, I think the final, uh, the final determination of what our posture is going to be precisely is still being discussed. And at this point, uh, until the uh, notams come out to the airmen, uh, I'd prefer not to comment. And, um, and for you, Scott, um, you mentioned, Scott, you mentioned keeping the, the, the thing dry. It's just totally unrelated, but I know you guys got some water in the PCR over the weekend with the rain, so I guess with the radiator or something like that on one of the payload bay doors, or I assume obviously you all have cleared that up, but maybe you could tell me about it. I'll start and you can finish. Um, as far as the payload is concerned, we did do a series of inspections on Saturday when the rain intrusion took place. We did not find any evidence of uh, water contacting the Goddard flight hardware, so from a payload perspective, we're clean. And subsequently, uh, from the orbiter perspective, uh, Bill, um, we did get about, uh, I characterize it by a shot glass full or so of water um, into the PCR, and it, it actually dripped onto the uh, orbiter radiator. That had been cleaned up, and inspections had been done, and right now we're just reviewing all the process of where that water could have gone and make sure that it's not a constraint for flight. And, uh, I think we'll be okay with that. Okay, thanks. Todd? Uh, Todd Halverson of Space.com for Scott. Um, could you give us an idea of what the concern was with the first reaction wheel that came down here in the first place and also why the decision was reversed to fly a second one down here to replace it? Well, I'm really not privy to all the details. We here locally spent all of our effort in looking at how we could support uh, Goddard performing that removal and replacement. I would have to refer you back to the, to the Goddard team to ask that question and we can get you in contact with the people that made that decision. Okay. Um, Steve, um, when do the NUNAMs go out? 
I uh, can't answer that specifically for this mission. When exactly target those going out, uh, I expect to be in the next uh, day or so, obviously. Any other questions? Dan? Uh, Dan, uh, Dan Billow with Channel 2. Uh, Steve, is there anything different at all in your approach uh, with Columbia having just come back from its OMDP and not launched in a couple of years? Uh, do you do anything different? Do you have any different expectations? Do you expect it to be cleaner during the countdown? I'm talking about the, specifically the countdown. Anything different at all? Our, our launch countdown is, is not affected by uh, OMDP per se. Um, there are some uh, modifications that we did to the orbiter that are going to result in some additional work in the countdown, but that's enhancements to existing systems. For example, uh, they did install what we call a micro whisk system in the orbiter aft compartment, which is strain gauge, uh, little strain gauges that are mounted on the thrust structure, and it will give us feedback as to what the stresses and strains are in, the, in, in Columbia during ascent. Now, that's good data that we want to have that will potentially extend the life of the orbiter um, as we go down into, into more flights. So that's a little bit of a change that we have in the countdown to actually program those devices for launch. In addition, we added uh, some other instrumentation um, at the orbiter umbilicals to measure uh, uh, flow rates past those umbilicals, and we have some uh, vent door cycles in the countdown to go ahead and, and uh, uh, provide for a checkout, if you will, of those sensors near the umbilicals. So those kinds of things, based on the modifications that were done, um, are going to be additions to the countdown. However, there's no additional requirements based on an OMDP flow to check out in the launch countdown. All those checks and requirement verifications have been done prior to getting in the launch countdown. And, and will those things be uh, done in effect from now on, and are, and are those things any different from uh, the other three ships? Well, as you recall, for STS-108, we flew the uh, MicroWIS uh, SGUs and, uh, in the mid-body and the aft, and we had those same kind of checkouts there. I, I expect that as the other orbiters are instrumented, we'll continue to do that work. As far as for the uh, uh, plate gap transducers that I was referencing on the umbilicals, uh, this is just in an engineering kind of phase as we go to full implementation, we'll be collecting data. So that'll go for a period of time before we baseline it in the countdown. Steve, this is strictly a liberal arts question. Um, but given all the stuff you guys did to Columbia in the downtime and the problems it had on its last ascent, et cetera, et cetera, if you're not an engineer and you look at that and think, good Lord, look at all the stuff they did, how can they be sure that they got everything back together the way it should have been? The question is, how confident are you that Columbia is uh, really ready to fly and that you guys have chased down everything that needed to be chased down? This has been a extensive um, uh, down period for Columbia probably the most extensive that we've done based on, if you recall, post STS-93, this orbiter went through uh, the most extensive wiring uh, inspection and modifications of, of any of the orbiters because it was in OMDP. So that gives us high confidence that we got the, the, the vehicle uh, working properly with respect to wiring. And we've, we've got some upgrades that are going to improve uh, safety and reliability and, and performance based on weight savings. Uh, this, this orbiter was taken apart and put back together and in, in such a manner where we have nothing but the highest confidence it's going to perform like it always does on orbit, which is, which is essentially flawless. Okay, thank you. Um, Marcia? <laughs> Marcia Dunn for Ed. Um, what, uh, what time of day do you expect to see the low the, the, the very low <coughs> on very Thursday. I mean, I know it's usually right before sunrise. That's well, why I asked. It'd be and very close to CT zero. That's so that's about the, the, right, right the in that time frame. And what is the the low temperature where, regardless of the winds, it's just not conceivable to launch? Well, literally, I checked with management on that. We go down to 36 degrees on this uh, wind graphic where you've got 15 knots, 36 degrees, and you're still green. So I guess. Um, Theoretically, if you go below 36, you're in trouble. But uh, management has indicated, I, I couldn't conceive of a situation, but let's say you were really cold and you got a warm front or something through, that the algorithm can literally recover from that. Uh, we used to believe that if it went below 36, that, that was uh, just total scrub. But in theory, uh, we can actually recover from that using the algorithm. The likelihood of that is probably about now. 
Tim Dem for Steve. Um, if you start getting into extended delays, um, what's the latest thinking on which mission would go first, uh, Hubble or the next station flight? These things are so close together, really. Yeah, actually, um, prefer to let the program folks uh, address their priorities there. However, I think if we go um, past the first uh, week of March or so, there would be a decision to make, I'll put, I'll put it that way, as to which one would have priority, but uh, um, we'll leave that up to them to decide. All right, uh, last call for questions. Okay, just a reminder that uh, coming up uh, immediately after this briefing, we will have a replay of the uh, crew arrival that occurred at 1 o'clock this morning Eastern Time, and then again at uh, 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, we'll have another countdown status briefing. And in about uh, 30 minutes, 10 o'clock this morning, we'll pick up the count. T minus 43 hour mark. Thank you. Ready for us? I just wanted to take a minute to say how happy and thrilled we all are to be here on such a beautiful night. Uh, to fly down was really a treat tonight. To fly over the orbiter and take a look at it sitting there on the pad, it looks ready to go. This crew is ready to go. Everybody has worked really hard to get us ready, to get the vehicle ready, and we're really looking forward to it. You know, the timing is really great as we're uh, looking back on 40 years of uh, Americans orbiting the Earth and just doing tremendous things in space. Hubble's been a big part of that for over the last 10 years, and we're looking forward to uh, helping to make it better, extend its reach uh, even further, deeper into our universe. I think it's going to be a, a, just a tremendous mission, and we're all uh, incredibly thrilled to be a part of it. I'd like uh, to get our payload commander up here and uh, talk for just a moment as well. John? Thanks, Scooter. It is very exciting to be down here. We've been training uh, for quite a while on making new improvements to Hubble, and it's going to be really spectacular when we're done. Uh, Hubble will be so much better, the new excitement that comes out, but the real message is going to be the teamwork and the team that's here at the Kennedy Space Center, the team at Goddard that's prepared all the hardware that's now in Columbia's payload bay, have just done a tremendous job getting us ready, getting the payload ready, getting the orbiter ready. And this team is also tremendous. We have uh, incredible depth of talent, and we're ready to go. We have uh, a tremendous arm operator in Nancy Curry. We have four EVA guys, myself, Rick Linehan, Jim Newman, Mike Massimino, that are ready to go uh, for the spacewalks and a tremendous flight deck team with Scooter, Bigger Carey, Dwayne Carey, and of course Nancy again, uh, getting us to orbit so we can get to Hubble. So we're really looking forward to this week for a smooth launch count and going up and fixing Hubble. To the crowd. Hey, thanks for coming out, guys. Really appreciate it. Hey, hey. For almost 12 years, the Hubble Space Telescope has given the world a revealing look at the universe. It's able to do this in part because of periodic servicing by astronauts that updates the telescope with the latest technology. The crew of STS-109 will carry out the fourth Hubble servicing mission. Our goal is to make it better and to give it a longer life. So more power, better instruments, and just an overall tune-up to make sure that it can take us through uh, into, you know, into this new century to continue making those incredible discoveries. The advanced camera for surveys will greatly improve Hubble's discovery potential. The ACS is actually a trio of cameras with specialized capabilities designed to broaden Hubble's vision. We can actually see 12 billion years back in time what the universe was like. And nothing like that has ever happened before. And with the ACS, the Advanced Camera for Surveys, we're going we're to be able to increase by tenfold the imaging capability of what we can see in terms of area and, and, and light gathering. The telescope will also get new solar arrays. Unlike Hubble's current arrays, the new arrays are rigid, less prone to damage, and smaller. Their smaller size makes them more aerodynamic, which will help preserve Hubble's orbit. But the new arrays will produce 30% more power than the old arrays, enough to operate up to four instruments at once, further increasing the telescope's scientific ability. The crew will also replace the power control unit. 
The PCU distributes electricity to the telescope's instruments. The original PCU is working, but has some damaged relays that might eventually cause it to fail. Meanwhile, the near-infrared camera and multi-object spectrometer, an instrument currently on board Hubble, will be outfitted with an experimental cooling system. NICMOS needs to stay ultra-cold to operate. It stopped working in 1999 when its coolant ran out. The NICMOS cooling system was designed to revive the instrument. And that's uh, something that a lot of scientists are very anxious about because the cooling system that was originally launched with that camera was supposed to last five years. It only lasted about a year and a half due to a thermal short. Uh, so they're very, very happy to get that back. And a high priority task was added to the already full mission late last year after a tachometer in one of Hubble's reaction wheel assemblies failed. Because that device is used to accurately point Hubble at its astronomical targets, the crew will replace it to ensure Hubble's ability to do science. It's the addition of that task to the rest of the schedule, I think, that is the biggest issue, that we uh, do it in an efficient manner. However, it is the number one priority now on our mission, so it's something we want to make sure that we get done and do correctly. Columbia's rendezvous with Hubble will be very busy, with Commander Scott Altman, sometimes called Scooter by his crew, Pilot Dwayne Carey, and flight engineer Nancy Curry taking center stage. Uh, we're going to start out with Scooter and I uh, working together along with Nancy to do the, do the orbital burns and the small little trim burns we need to keep us uh, uh, um, heading toward Hubble. And there comes a point when Scooter is going to uh, go to the aft flight deck so he can look out the overhead window and uh, uh, fly us up toward Hubble. Meanwhile, Mission Specialist Rick Linehan will keep an eye on the distance between the two spacecraft. I will be using a handheld unit, not on all of them like uh, what they get you with on the highways when you're speeding, the same kind of uh, unit. And, uh, and I will back up calls with the computer and the radar to make sure that we have, uh, you know, uh, I guess an extra level of redundancy. With computer assistance from Mission Specialist Mike Massimino, Curry will then use the shuttle's robotic arm to grapple the telescope and carefully pull it into Columbia's payload bay. Hubble comes down at an attitude of about 58, uh, 52 degrees with respect to the payload bay. And that's because the Hubble and the arrays are so massive that due to clearance concerns, to give us a little more clearance, we come down with it kind of uh, at a diagonal to the payload bay. Once the telescope is secured on the flight support system, a versatile work platform, it will be examined and prepared for servicing over the next several days. Payload Commander John Grunsfeld, a spacewalker on the 1999 Hubble mission, and rookie spacewalker Linehan are scheduled to install the first new solar array, beginning the makeover of Hubble. Uh, I think a lot of people are used to seeing the arrays in Hubble kind of flapping around those, those pretty kind of gossamer gold arrays. These are actually uh, two hinged panels that will fold out the cool part about it is they have this uh, greenish-blue uh, glass covering, which is gallium arsenide photocells, which are going to collect the sunlight current electricity. Thermal covers will also be installed on this day to protect Hubble's scientific instruments from the cold of space. While the spacewalkers are outside, the rest of the crew will be busy inside. Altman will back up Curry on robotic arm, while Carey uses video equipment to document the spacewalk. Meanwhile, Mission Specialist Jim Newman and Massimino, the other spacewalking team, will help manage the spacewalk. I'll be calling out the reminders to the spacewalkers of what they're expected to do next. I'll be telling them how tight to tighten the bolts, what torque settings to set on the power tool in order to loosen the bolts, when to do the various activities they're doing. If we find a bolt that, that won't loosen the way we expect it to, we have a, what we call a crib sheet, and I'll be looking at that sheet and see that information in gym. After the new array and its supporting electrical hardware are installed, the 23-foot by 9-foot array will be opened like a book, exposing it to sunlight. The next day, 
Newman and Nasamino, another rookie spacewalker, are scheduled to complete the solar array changeout by installing a new array on the other side of Hubble. Then they'll replace the suspect reaction wheel assembly, which was installed on the second servicing mission. This is a well-defined task. It's a kind of a round object. It's a, a, about two and a half feet wide. It weighs 105 pounds, and it, it just looks nice. And so the whole task of taking it out, swapping it, and putting it back in flows very smoothly. Before the power control unit can be replaced the next day, ground controllers must completely power the telescope down for the first time ever. And they'll be watching very closely when Hubble is finally powered back up. If you turn something off and then it's when you turn it back on again, usually the light bulb will flicker out or the TV will crackle. It's really at that point that there's, there's actually probably our greatest risk to the telescope. Removing the old PCU also presents a challenge, specifically undoing several rows of connectors on the unit, which are nearly impossible to remove with pressurized gloves on. It's this huge black box with rows and rows, about 36 connectors on the sides and on the bottom, and uh, we will actually have to get in there with really little clearance. We have to use a special tool that will go in and grab the connectors and take them off because there's no room for your hands to get in there. The activities in this spacewalk could cause it to run over its allotted time. So scenarios are in place that will allow the crew to break out of the EVA at various points, leaving the telescope safe to deploy. The next day, the advanced camera for surveys is scheduled to be installed into the aft shroud axial bay. The refrigerator-sized ACS uses state-of-the-art imaging technology and will replace the faint object camera, Hubble's last original scientific instrument. With the addition of the advanced camera for surveys, I think the discovery space that we're opening up uh, leads me to the belief that the next most incredible discovery that Hubble will make is something that we can't even imagine now. The spacewalkers are also scheduled to install an electronics support module on this day for the NICMOS cooling system. The NCS goes in on the following day. It includes a massive radiator that will be mounted on the outside of Hubble. The radiator will work with a cryogenic cooler inside that uses high-speed turbines and neon gas to cool NICMOS and a conduit to disperse heat. We're going to snake through the bottom of the telescope a bunch of plumbing that contains electronic uh, control lines but also cooling lines and plumbing it through a hole in the bottom of the telescope that was essentially a vent line previously. After the crew is done servicing Hubble, they'll send the orbiting observatory back on its way with Massimino starting the process. The plan is going to be for me to go in and and go to grapple with the telescope while it still burns and then do the unburn. And then Nancy will, will take over. She'll release it and back the arm away. We should be uh, motionless at that point, just flying together. I'll do a couple of burns with the stick, again, manual inputs, and Hubble will appear to pass right over the top of the orbiter. Then we get to watch this great observatory that we've now made much better uh, recede off into the distance. They'll then prepare for the return trip home, anticipating some future discovery by Hubble that Columbia's crew helped make possible.